Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at the Winds of Winter. It, it feels like a little while since we've looked at just the books, uh, so I thought we would go back to what we know, what we're expecting. Um, obviously over the course of the next few months we will start getting caught up in what's going on with the TV shows, uh, both um, Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones, uh, but I do want to keep the focus in on the books, particularly things like The Winds of Winter, which someday, someday will happen. Um, but uh, I've got a load of questions, as always, from my patrons. That's how I'm going to structure this, as is the way of these things. We will be dotting around quite a little bit uh, from place to place. Uh, but uh, if you've got any questions, do drop them in the chat. I will try and pick up as much as I possibly can. But I should probably start by also giving a quick apology for last week. If you were watching last week, we had quite an abrupt end uh, to the live stream. Uh, my internet died. Sorry, sometimes these things uh, happen. Uh, by the time I managed to get it back up, then the YouTube had timed out the live stream. So I apologize for that. Um, I think I managed to get through all my Patreon questions and uh, I was just trying to catch up on the chat and I don't think I missed any super chats. So uh, apologies if you had uh, put in uh, some fantastic questions in the chat that I missed, but um, I will try and uh, spend extra time in the chat today to pick up on as much as I can. Uh, so uh, we always try and do a very quick overview of what's going on in the wider world of TV books um, just at the top of each of these live streams. couple of things to be aware of. Squid Game has been renewed for season two. Um, I really liked Squid Game. I know I'm not alone in that. I was a little bit of a late adopter to it. Everyone was raving about it, and so I caught up on it a little bit late. I thought it was fantastic. So there's a chance... I might cover Squid Game Season 2. We'll see. I don't know when that's going to come. They've only just announced the renewal now, so it won't be happening certainly this year, almost certainly not next year, so that's probably not till 2024 that we actually see it. But they've also Netflix announced that they're doing a, uh, a, a, a game show, I think, based on Squid Game, which, I guess, it's... Um, almost set up for it but uh, i think netflix clearly have seen this is a huge success and they're going to try and milk it for everything that they can so be ready for lots of squid game stuff coming uh second thing raised by wolves apparently has been cancelled i never personally got into raised by wolves but i know a lot of people who i respect who said it was excellent so um i'm Sorry to see that go. Um, in the world of the Lord of the Rings, we do have a little bit of an update, though, in terms of the War of the Rohirrim. Now, for those who aren't 100% up to speed on this and completely understand why you would not be, the rights for the Lord of the Rings are very complicated at the moment, to the extent that even the experts aren't 100 percent sure who owns exactly which rights to which different things there are some rights even now being uh, put up for auction but what we do know is that whereas amazon has got the rights to be making tv shows uh, based upon the hobbit and the lord of the rings and the appendices new line warner brothers who made the original films still retain some rights to be making more lord of the rings content specifically lord of the rings films and they have announced this announcement was six months maybe even a year ago they are making an anime uh, feature length of the War of the Rohirrim, the story of Helm Hammerhand. Now, this is very exciting. It is a long way away still. This is 2024. They've even done a release date. I think it's April 2024. We don't know huge amounts about it. One thing that I do know is John Howe was briefly involved in this for aficionados of John Howe's work and, and his work as a creative designer. He was the person who was largely responsible for the look that we had for the Peter Jackson of the Rings films. So he was briefly involved in this as well. And we've had a couple of stills that looked promising. But real news is now starting to trickle out. We've got a couple of voice actors announced. The first is intriguing. Miranda Otto, who was Eowyn in the original films. Now, 
this is set hundreds of years before that, so she's not, uh, presumably, they're not actually having her as Eowyn in it, but probably this is her relating the story, or maybe she does the beginning and the end, something along those lines. The other name which has been announced is Brian Cox, who's obviously a fantastic actor from Succession, and he is going to be Helm Hammerhand, who, I mean, I think this works really, really well. Helm Hammerhand is not uh, a meek character, put it that way. And uh, so I think this is this is positive. I'm very much looking forward to it. I know some people who are looking forward to that even more than they're looking forward to the Rings of Power. This is, it has to be said, based on a story that Tolkien, it's not in huge depth, but certainly a story, a discrete story that Tolkien wrote, based in the Third Age, about the Rohirrim and that one of their legendary leaders. So uh, in that sense, it differs from what we're going to be seeing in the Rings of Power season one, which is, and I'll probably talk about this more in a Lord of the Rings stream, but that's a lot more um, open, shall we say. It's the Tolkien only wrote one real story in based in the Second Age. Um, lots of big events but only one real story and that real story is not going to be included in this the rings of power so uh this is a tolkien story that we have got that is being made into an anime and i'm quite excited and the voice actors seem very good so far so that's something to look forward to but 2024 um okay and i think with this um I am going to go on to the subject we've got today. Um, thank you, first of all, to Sylvia Glasso, uh, Mara Lee, and Britt Logan. Uh, some very generous uh, super chat, super stickers before uh, we went on there. Thank you. I hugely appreciate them. Um, and uh, let's go to, we had a another super chat from, let's see, let's see what I can find find it with a question very early on from Brendan and this is a good place to start this I think because it's a it's the elephant in the room if we don't address it what do you think about the winter ain't coming theory now I'm I'm assuming by that you mean the the theory that George R. R. Martin is simply not going to finish writing The Winds of Winter, which a lot of people say. And if you go to um, pretty much any of my videos about The Winds of Winter, you will find people who just simply say that. That's the comment that they make. It's not happening. It's not gonna, it's not gonna come. Um, what do I say to that? I mean, I can't guarantee it's coming. Um, the only person who is in charge of that is George R. R. Martin himself. Uh, I see no reason to doubt his progress reports. Um, I see no reason to doubt that he is most of the way through it from what he says. I see no reason to doubt that he does intend to finish it. Um, and I think we would start getting those hints coming through at some point. He does... He does want to finish this. He just wants to do other things as well. That's my take on it. I think I think it is going to happen, uh, but it's just going to be a bit a bit further away than we might want it to be. It's obviously already been a long wait. We'll cover all of that in just one moment. But um, will it come? Yeah, I mean, he, he even. I mean, the old age thing is a thing we have to accept. He is getting older. And he accepts that he's getting older as well. In his last blog post, he even went as far as to say, and I know I am very old. So he is accepting this fact. So, yes, I, I think it will come. Uh, I can't guarantee it. Obviously, I can't guarantee it. Uh, but I see no reason to doubt him. Um uh, Rick the Reader just picking up in the chat saying, isn't there also a Witcher prequel series coming soon? Uh, yes, Witcher Blood Origin, which is going to be looking at the origins of the, the Witchers um, and hopefully a lot of things, uh, Witcher lore related, like the conjunction of the spheres, things like that. That 
has had not the easiest production as reading between the lines, but it will happen. It is a mini series and it is probably now going to happen somewhere around Christmas. They finished filming it. They went back. They did some reshoots, had a bit of a rethink about it. But uh, and there is a trailer, an early trailer out there somewhere from about November, uh, which looked good. Um, but yes, that will happen, and it will happen, I think, towards the end of the year. Uh, Roman Lakovets, uh, thank you very much, saying, have you seen Preston Jacobs' recent video about the writing process for wins? If he is correct, it, it would explain why George R. R. Martin has been so reluctant to talk about his progress over the years. Um, I haven't seen it. I, I mean, I wish I, I had more time to watch other people's uh, videos it has to be said so i don't know what the right what preston said about the writing process for it um one thing that has become reasonably apparent in his most recent blog post is he is sort of doing stories in chunks he did a cersei chunk uh, that's what he uh, i think he called it a chunk um of chapters and now he's moving on to jamie and brienne so the the writing process he's not given any hint that it's any different to his normal writing process he is a gardener writer he will allow the characters and the stories to um, develop as he writes it rather than him working to a plan um, but i will happily have a look at that see what preston said if he's got some insight into uh what george R. R. martin's writing uh position has or what writing stance has been um uh, i will have a look at that um question let's go to some questions from my patrons johnny targs saying hello robert my question to you is when is the winds of winter coming no i'm just kidding um I want to give George R. R. Martin all the time and patience he needs to finish the book and finish it right. My real question is, what is your theory, if any, as to what will take place in the very last chapter of The Winds of Winter? Now, this is quite interesting. As I say, we'll be dotting around because in a bit I've got a question about the very first chapter. But I, in terms of setting the bounds for what this is... The, George R. R. Martin, when you look at how he writes, each chapter and each book has an arc. It has a narrative. It it starts in one place. It ends in the other place. It's not, and and there there is a clear line between them. It is not just. I've got this huge long story called The Song of Ice and Fire, and I'm just here's the first chunk, here's the second chunk, here's the third chunk. Down, as I say, even down to the level of short of the each chapter reads like a short story. There is some kind you get an initial situation, you get some problem, you get some um, addressing of the problem, you reach some sort of conclusion. Now, that happens chapter by chapter. There are a few differences, but generally speaking, that's what he does chapter by chapter, and then you get the Books work at a, a bigger level, but they are they are books in and of their own right. Why I say that is because what this means is that we will be ending at a particular point um, in for the winds of winter, not just a George R. Martin going, oh, I've finished. Let's just get this lot out, and now I'm going to get on to doing the next. No, he's writing a an overall arc that will that will reach an end point. So I think we need to think about what a logical end point for this is. And the, the logical end pieces for this are Danny arriving in Westeros, the others um, arriving at, the, at Westeros at the other end. That is the end point because that sets us up for the finale, the last book. Now, it's possible that he just writes so much he decides that he's not actually going to take it that far and he ends it. There are various other points at which we could reach a reasonable end narrative point. The Starks regaining control of Winterfell would be one of them. Um, and... Uh, the situation in King's Landing being ready for Danny to arrive at the beginning of the next book, that would be a, 
a, a point at which he could naturally end. But for me, I think that he wants to end this with the dragons coming from one side of Westeros and the others coming from the other side of Westeros, because this is the Song of Ice and Fire. These are the threats to humanity, the existential threats, ice and fire, the others and the dragons. And if he's bringing this to the end book, the end book has to be set up with those two threats coming to Westeros. Uh, Persephone saying it was my 52nd name day this week. Well, a happy name day, happy birthday to you for this week. Um, question from... Um, so Brendan, just want to say thank you for this amazing channel. Uh, I will not be able to listen to the whole stream as I'm in Norway. It's late here. Good night. Well, I hope you, the, the answer to your initial question was to your liking. And yeah, it's it gets late here and uh, Norway's even later. So uh, uh, absolutely, I completely understand. But thank you so much. Uh, Flotfear13 saying a little splash for your mods. Thanks for keeping the chat in line and always being welcoming and positive. Yes, thank you, moderators. You are amazing. Uh, if you are in the chat, please do uh, give the moderators a little bit of love. They, uh, they deserve it. They are wonderful. Um, Question from Joel Linksy saying, thank you for all of your videos, countless hours listening at work. Well, thank you very much. I uh, hugely appreciate that. And then Cloaked One, uh, birthday shout out. It was Persephone's. Oh, I just beat you to it. Uh, thank you, though. The Persephone, again, happy name day. Um, and uh, Kunina Stricker. Do you think we will have an epilogue? I like to believe that some poor Dragonstone citizen is is coming face to face with the dragon. Yeah, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. Um, so we don't get epilogues every time. He likes to do prologues to his books, epilogues sometimes. Now, epilogues um, obviously can wrap up the storyline for a book and also set it up for the next one. Um, I agree with you. This works quite well for me. The idea with prologues and epilogues often, uh, in fact, pretty much as is the, always the case, the POV character, it's not one of the main POV characters, but this uh, new POV character dies. So, for example, at the end of The Dance of the Dragons, it was Kevin Lannister. We'd not had a POV chapter from him before. At the end of it, he died. What might happen at the end of um, uh, The Winds of Winter? If we have an epilogue chapter, yes, I agree completely. If the end point is the dragons arriving, then you could show that very dramatically by having somebody on Dragonstone. They know that they're on their way, they're waiting, and then the dragons come in and they die. That would be... A, a hugely powerful way of doing it. Similarly, you could do it at the wall. That, and I think they did this sort of on the TV show. You have, and I think didn't they have the uh, Beric and um, Tormund there looking out, um, and then suddenly seeing the others, the army of the dead coming towards the wall. That, or, or even indeed seeing the wall being destroyed, or something like that would be an amazing way to end the book. Um, either of those would work for me. Um, and yes, either of them, you could very easily have a POV character who dies with the coming of um, ice or fire to Westeros. Um, question from Shasha. Jamie will almost certainly have to do something for the Brotherhood to save his and Brienne's and Podrick's lives. How much will that change him? Might he temporarily switch sides somewhat in earnest? Will the relationship with Brienne start here already? Might George R. R. Martin have not even decided any of that yet, as he seems to be writing those exact chapters right now? Yes, he is. This is this is his latest update. As I said a moment ago, is he said he finished some Cersei chapters and now he is writing about Jamie Brienne, which is uh, a hint, first of all, 
if we have a chunk of Jamie, uh, of Cersei chapters, clearly we thought she was going to anyway, clearly she survives for at least a goodly way into this book and probably beyond. If he's writing about Jamie and Brienne, that implies that they are together for some chapters at least. So this is interesting. This is good. I, I've i said before, I'll probably say it again um, later in the stream in relating to another question. To, to my mind, the most complex bit of writing The Winds of Winter is actually not all of the, the headline things, what happens with John, what happens with Danny, any of the big battles. Actually, the most complex bit, I think, is what happens in the Riverlands. And that's because it's got so many different moving parts. We've got Lady Stoneheart, the Brotherhood Without Banners. We've got Brienne and Jamie there. Uh, we've got some members of the Brotherhood who've moved off and headed away. We've got Sandor probably is still there, may well make an appearance at some point. We've got the garrison from River Run who were set free and are wandering around. Uh, we've got the Blackfish. We've got um, Jane Westerling, who we'll talk about in a moment, who is going to be heading west. We've got so many moving parts. Nymeria's uh, super pack of wolves. And because you've got all these different moving parts, that means that what happens will depend on the order in which each of these different moving parts interacts with the others. So that was, um, and I mean, I don't want to put it down on it, that was the issue that George R. R. Martin had that slowed him down writing and Dance with the Dragons was what he called the Miranese Knot, which was his issue with lots of people are coming to Marine and he was wondering about the order in which they should arrive because the order in which they should arrive affects the action when people get there who's there already when they arrive that kind of thing and he his writing process was such that he he wrote a few chapters going down one path and then said actually no that doesn't work. So we then started again. Uh, when do I want Quentin Martel to arrive? Do I want him to arrive um, well before um, Danny has come to this this agreement to, uh, to marry? What about on the you know, day before the wedding? Afterwards, he obviously eventually decided just before the wedding. And he went with that, but he explored the other options to see what will happen with the story. That's what's going on in the Riverlands, is there is lots of different moving parts and they will all interact in different ways depending on the order in which they meet. So, um, uh, that's a slight digression, but let's talk about Jamie. Um, is he going to switch sides? He, in his mind is already shifting. The last few chapters of his that we had is him actively rejecting what his family would do, what he thinks his, the expectation of him is and has been. He gets a letter from Cersei saying, come and help me, um, come and be my champion. And he rips it up and burns it. He's not having any of that. He thinks about winter's coming now to the riverlands what would my father do i don't think that's the right way um he goes through these processes he is he is mentally separating himself from the lannisters and that leaves him in the position when brienne comes to him and says come let's uh, let's go and uh, uh basically fulfill the quest that we've got uh, he seems to go with that. So he's already started that process. It, it, so he is switching sides if, in a sense because Lady Stoneheart is clearly anti-Lannister. He will need to win trust. He will need to basically do things for her as will Brienne. Uh, they've got an interesting interaction. The three of them, they're series of oaths and promises one to another is is really complicated and the three of them 
will have to work out, but they all want the same thing. Can they trust each other? The thing they want is to find the Stark children. Um, so yes, he's going to be shifted. This is the shift. I think this shift is going to carry on. It will carry on and end with him heading north with Brienne. I think that is where we're going to end up with this, because at some point, news is going to start filtering down that um, Cersei is going a little bit mad queen down in King's Landing. She's going to be falling in with Euron very probably, but up north there is this existential threat. That is where Jamie is going to be heading. So that is the his his arc that he's heading on. And I think yes, we're going to see it happening in this book, but it has already started for him mentally um in the last few chapters that we saw. Um, Sam Day saying, good morning from Australia. G'day to you. My question is around, um, is around me being a bit worrisome. How similar do you think the winds of winter will adhere to the show's version of events? I know George has said that he gave the writers an outline of where to go. So will it be the same, same ending, but a different journey or completely different? Well, I think the only thing that we can say to this is just echo what George R. R. Martin's words were. Um, in terms of the ending, he was asked, and I think he actually put it in a blog post, uh, is my ending going to be the same as the ending on the show? Yes and no, and yes and no, and yes and no, was his unhelpful response. The other slightly unhelpful thing was him saying the big beats of the ending will be the same, but then he goes back to this thing that he said for quite a while he talks about the butterfly effect of changes made relatively early on on the show and what that means later on now one of those is the exclusion of a character like Fagon which at the time probably felt to the showrunners like a relatively small change but when you work it through Fagon in the books has just launched an invasion of Westeros. I think there's a very good chance he will take King's Landing. If he takes King's Landing, that pushes Cersei out. She has to go off and head, presumably after Castle Rock. And when uh, Danny arrives, then she is faced not with Cersei dug in, but somebody who claims to be another Targaryen, who is probably going to be actually quite competent and loved by the people of King's Landing, which is a completely different dynamic to what happened on the show. So that butterfly effect we felt across what happened with Dawn, what's happening um, in lots of different areas, and even some smaller characters like Makoro, um, like Marwin the Mage, that just simply aren't in the TV show, they will have an impact as well. So um, he did give an outline to the showrunners. I think we can't pretend that he didn't. He's, he spent several days, we're told, I think it was five days, talking them through what his plans were. And so they were aware of them. And we're, the TV show is not going to be completely different to where we end up in the books but the books are going to take, and this for me is the crucial thing, as well as the butterfly effect that George R. Martin always emphasizes, for me the crucial thing is the speed at which they get there. The, the books will take their time, and so things will not feel rushed. A, an example I can remember using when season eight was on, Jamie and Brienne, we had many seasons, six seasons perhaps, of this slow burn relationship until they got together and then Jamie left her and everyone was like, oh, I don't like that, that's not good. Maybe that's going to happen on the books, maybe not. But the reason it didn't feel good in the TV show, in my view, was the fact after this huge slow build up, what we had was three scenes. We had one scene when they got together. We had one scene where Jamie and Tyrion 
are talking about them being together. We had one season when one scene when they split up. We never actually saw them together. And that was rushed. If they had given us a whole period when uh, they are together, but Jamie is there and we start from his POV, we can see his doubts, we can see his worry about Cersei, which is still there. Um, we can uh, perhaps see through Tyrion's eyes that Jamie still isn't over Cersei. George R. R. Martin is a good enough writer to make that work. I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but that, I think, is a good example of how what happened on the TV show it could, as a big beat, be correct but work better in the books because they're done not in a rush. Um, so I hope that makes sense. And you can apply that to a lot of the other, not all of the other things, but a lot of the other things that happened in season eight. The showrunners wanted to finish that show in a rush. And as a result, things got squashed. Um Brendan, one last question, if I may. Of course, what will Euron do? Thanks again. I've got a question about Euron. Um, I'll try and wrap this one up with that one. So I'll, I'll answer this. Euron um, is in the books very clearly a hugely charismatic, dangerous, crazy individual. His stated aim is literally to become a god. That is what he is trying to do. And he is going to do that by being king of the ashes. He is going to basically try and destroy everything. And people will see him as being the god. So how is he doing this? Well, we know the first bit of his plan pretty much, which is he is getting a massive sea battle. Now, you may, if if you follow this channel, you may well know I've been doing a series of collaboration videos uh, with the fantastic history of Westeros. The next one of them that will come out is uh, based on a question that I get asked a lot about Euron, which is, will Euron summon a kraken awesome krakens um it's, so if you're interested in that do uh I'm, I'm hoping that one maybe next week i'll get that one out but what he is doing is he is trying to just do everything he's having a massive sea battle he's waited literally hung around and waited for the largest fleet in uh westeros to arrive he could have he could have uh taken advantage normal military tactics would be to uh, to separate and conquer smaller forces at a time but he seems to have waited for the two fleets to the, the high tower fleet and the um the red wine fleet to come and um pincer movement him but that seems to be because he just wants to create carnage he's strapped people to the the bowels the front of of his ships who is it he's doing well aaron a priest plus some other priests he's found plus some mages he's found plus uh, a woman that he slept with and he's carrying his child he's a king let's not forget he's he's the rightful king of the iron islands he he's the closest that we have got to a democratically elected uh, leader um uh, take that as uh, as as a, a, indictment of democracy if you wish it's not, obviously it's not a full democracy but digression uh she's carrying his child that means that that's king's blood going on there and we know how important that is he is going to create huge amounts of magic he's also got some scam going on with dragon binder trying to gain control of a dragon over the far side of the world there's another big battle happening he is going to do everything huge amounts of casualties blood in the water we know that blood in the water this is one of the hints we got from fire and blood part one blood in the water will attract krakens um and we will see the high towers surely Leighton high tower is coming up with some kind of magic there's so much it's just going to be 
apocalyptic what's going on there. So that's the first thing. Um, after that, surely he's going to start attacking Old Town itself and take over that part of the world. So that is what Euron is up to. The idea of him um, having some kind of complicated uh, diplomatic plan, forget it. He's just about creating chaos and destruction and so getting people to worship him as a god um so that's what your going to be up to um you won't be able to take your eyes off of it um question from um where do we get up to alejandro martinez saying hey robert do you think the the GNC will be resolved in the Winds of Winter. That's the great um, uh, northern conspiracy. Um, what are your thoughts on it? I don't think you've made a video about it, have you? No, I have not. Um, now, I will at some point. Um, actually, maybe that's a good, another good one to be uh, to be doing with History of Westeros because there's a lot going on there. The Grand Northern Conspiracy is basically... It, it, the Boltons are in charge of Winterfell and they are there with some allies but a lot of the northern houses have sort of fallen in alongside them but clearly aren't on side. House Mandley is the biggest example of this. House Mandley are stark loyalists and they clearly have a plan. We know Roman Mandley has got a plan. He's he sent off Davos to go and try and find Rickon why is he trying to find Rickon? Because he wants a Stark to be able to put back into Winterfell. So that's definitely going on. Um, others are involved in this uh, as well. Um, there is a lot of manoeuvring things that are very suspicious. Uh, the, the use of the snowmen, I think, is very... Um, is sending messages from inside Winterfell to the people outside Winterfell. Um, the um, the phrase, nobody likes the phrase, people will be trying to get rid of the phrase, this Grant Northern conspiracy is going to work. And we're going to see that happen in the early chapters, I think, of the Winds of Winter. The issue is, I think, that this is going to come... Not crashing down, but once the Boltons have gone, there will be an issue is, well, what now? Because although there's a general feeling everyone hates the phrase, everyone doesn't like, dislikes the Boltons or hates the Boltons, um, and everyone wants the Starks back in, who? Who is going to be back in who's who's going to be the stark back in winterfell clearly the mandalies have decided on rickon but rickon is only the heir if you think that bran is dead and then what about rob's will if rob's will comes to light and rob's will as it probably did legitimizes john does that suddenly make john the heir because that would be what rob wrote his will about but then he was writing that on the basis that Bran and Rickon were both dead. What if you decide that that will therefore doesn't count because um, it was written under a false assumption? And what if Rickon dies? And what if Bran hasn't appeared yet? Well, who's the heir then? Is it Sansa, perhaps? So suddenly you get lots of these different um, candidates, and they themselves may not each be wanting to be the Lord or Lady of Winterfell, but there will be people coming behind them who do want that. So yes, we are going to have a Grand Northern Conspiracy, which is going to work, but after it's worked, that's the point at which it gets really interesting. Who are they going to rally behind um, at the end of all of it? Um... Adrian Birchall saying the show was more interested in the battle for the Iron Throne than the war with the others. Uh, yeah, I think that's a fair challenge. Kelly Johnson saying, will John and Danny have a passionate romance? I think that the uh, the hints are definitely there. There was Danny back in uh, the House of the Undying. She has that vision. 
It is a sweet smelling blue rose growing from uh, the ice wall is the general interpretation of this is um, that is John. Um, she, we certainly think she's going to have another lover based upon this. Three loves you will have. The, the implication certainly seems to be that she will get another lover. Uh, and John, let's face it, is her type. As far as we can tell her type, she definitely, she liked Carl Drogo. Uh, she liked Dario. They're both um, good fighters, leaders, um, and John does seem to sort of fit into that uh, kind of mold. So, yes, I think is the short answer to that. Uh, Adam Wilson saying, sorry if it's been asked, but do you think George R. R. Martin is finishing both The Winds of Winter and A Dream of Spring before releasing The Winds of Winter? Uh, P.S. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you. No, I do not. I think he is, he said very clearly that he is a gardener writer, and I think what that means is he's working it out as he goes along. I see absolutely no reason. I think he's. This was suggested by the actor who played Barristan Selmy, whose name escapes me, and I think, I think he denied it. Um, I see absolutely no reason why he um, would be lying about this and be secretly writing the Winds of Winter. It would be going against everything that he's ever, he's done before. So I see no reason why that's the case. I. I'd love it to be the case. I'd love to have the winds of winter and then George go, ha ha. And, and here we've got a dream of spring as well. I do not think that's going to happen. I, people ask, people say, you know, the winds of winter is not going to happen. I, I think probably we are going to get the winds of winter and probably we're going to get it in the not too distant future. I'm, I'm well past predicting when, but uh, I think that will happen. A dream of spring that's not going to be an easy book to write. That's going to take him a while. Uh, that's the one I'm worried about. I'm not so worried about The Winds of Winter. Cloaked One, uh, picking up for Ebenezer Gurnemer. Uh, thank you, Cloaked One. I love it when people do this, picking up questions for other people. Hi, Robert. I believe the prologue will be with Jane Westerling, according to George R. R. Martin. What do you think we'll see? Uh, Rescue by the Blackfish, a reveal of Rob's will, etc., um, yeah, again, this was a question I got from my patron, so I'll wrap that question up with uh, this. Actually, this is uh, this is Mara Lee. This was the, the next question. Hi there, Mara. Uh, the next question I was going to come to from my patron, so I'll pick this one up there, uh, saying, what do you think we will see in the prologue? What insights or info would you like to read about or hope is in the prologue? So, George R. R. Martin has said, J uh, Jane Westling, this is Rob's widow, will appear in the prologue. Now, uh, the first thing to say is he very clearly did not say it's going to be her POV, but that she will appear. Now, where and why and how might she appear? She is going to be transported. We, we know this because we saw Jamie making this decision. She is going to be transported to the Westlands. She is going from the Riverlands, uh, basically under Lannister arrest, and they're taking her over to the Westlands. They wish they're absolutely adamant that they don't want even a hint that she could be pregnant with Rob's child, so they have to keep her very not pregnant and not having children very publicly for a long time. Um, so that's what's happening to her. Almost certainly, given the timing that we've got here and also what the motivations of some of these characters we've got in uh, the Riverlands, almost certainly what's going to happen is her being uh, rescued in some way. The, uh, the wagon train which is taking her west being attacked. Now, who could do this? There are lots of possibilities. I, I talked earlier about the huge number of different people who are in the Riverlands. The Blackfish is definitely there. Um, let's not forget that in the Riverlands, they swore fealty to Rob as well. So this isn't just like a, a random, um, oh, I think I might go and help out um, Rob's widow. This is... They, they swore fealty to the King of the North. So the Blackfish is there. His garrison are out there. 
Lady Stoneheart is out there. She's absolutely focused in on what happened with the Red Wedding, understandably. And here is somebody who survived. This is her daughter-in-law. Of course she would wish her to be saved. Nymeria Super Pack is actively hunting down Freys and Lannisters at the moment. We just hear these little bits of reports of what's going on there. All of these people could take out um, that uh, wagon train. The interesting point is whether this is going to be her POV or not. If it is, POV characters and prologues die in George R. R. Martin's works, and that would obviously be a big blow to Team Stark. Um, but also, um, I, I think the the bigger thing we have to be looking for here is what is the point of this as a prologue? George R. R. Martin doesn't just go, oh, that's a cool idea. I'll have that as a prologue. He uses prologues for very specific reasons. The, the, the idea of a prologue is to introduce themes, ideas that are going to be running through that book in some way, shape or form, or something that he wants us to understand to sort of hover over that book. Um, for example, the others, we were the, the prologue to book one, we're introduced to the others. The others are then, they're not ignored for the rest of what happens. There's a lot going on there, but we need to know. The important thing is that we as readers know this is a real threat. This isn't a made up thing. This is a real threat which is happening. So that's that's the theme that was introduced there. We had Varamir six skins as a pro later on as a prologue that was introducing concepts about uh, skin changing, how that works, and crucially, how you can have a second life when your human body has been killed. You can then go off into the creature that you walk into and have a second life there. Why is that important? Because at the end of the book, John dies. And the way that George R. R. Martin describes the process of what happens there is the same way he describes it with Varamir Sixkin. So he's teeing up something. You get the point. The I, What George R. R. Martin does is he uses the prologue to introduce themes that are going to be there through the book. What themes is he going to be introducing here? Well, the, 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 the big one is what's happening in the Westlands is the Lannisters who, as we left it, had basically taken control. Jamie had gone through, taken control of everywhere, River Run, uh, Braintree Hall. He'd just gone through and claimed everywhere for the, the Lannisters. The Lannisters were in control. And they were in control in King's Landing. Um, Kevin Lannister was, uh, was there right until the very, very end. And things were going good for the Lannisters. Um, this is the turn. This is the point at which the Lannisters, their rule is ending. So this is one of the big things we're going to see from this, is that uh, the Lannisters think they've got a plan, that they're going to take Jane Westling away. It's not going to work. The Lannisters' rule in the Riverlands is coming to an end. There's also a possibility that um, the will might start uh, coming out because... Uh, who would Rob have talked to about his will, perhaps his wife? So this is the kind of thing. There will be some themes. I talked about the importance of the will in relation to who rules in Winterfell at the end. So there are definitely some themes that George R. Martin will want to be um, uh, mapping out for the whole book. Um Andrew K, in, interesting quick point about um, Aaron, who's through whose perspective we are going to see Euron. You're saying um, he's very much under the influence. George R. R. Martin will likely give us less is more, and we have to question some of the details or accounts like Carson's. In, indeed, but we are seeing this from his perspective. Um, he is. Uh, and this, th I find this fascinating because this is something I do not know whether George R. Martin is going to go down this route. If he does, 
it, it, it will probably be some of the best writing he does if he pulls this off. Aaron as a character, we think of him as being this absolutist priest of the drowned god, which he is, but he wasn't always. He started out, he, he was a wild child, he was young and carefree, then he had this conversion experience and became this absolutely 100% um, leader of the priests uh, of um, the Dragon God. Might he have another conversion? What Euron wants is for uh, Aaron to worship him as God, to recognize that he is God. What is Aaron going to see? He is going to see Euron calling forth Krakens and them emerging, probably. Is that going to be enough to challenge his faith? It's entirely possible. We have to sort of for this um, theme of what er what Euron is trying to do of him wanting to be God. We will have to see some people start to worship him as God. Otherwise, it's just pointless. It's just uh, he's, he's being a laugh. Can stop for Marcus is yes, he's crazy, but he's he's a challenge because people are going to start believing in him. Are we going to see Aaron be his first major convert? I don't know, but it's entirely possible. It's just something that's been bubbling around in the back of my mind. But yes, he is the person through whose eyes we are going to see most of what Euron does in this book, the first part of this book. Um, Vet the Warlock saying, I know she's not the biggest character, but uh, I've become very fond of Barbary Dustin. Yes, a lot of us have. What do you see for her future? I need some more of her snarky sass. Okay, so Barbary Dustin, great character. She is in Winterfell. She um, is the uh, widow of Lord Dustin, who was one of the people who Ned, one of the seven in Ned's team that went to the Tower of Joy way back in the back story. And he died there. And Ned came back with the horse that he was riding on, but not his bones. And this Barbie Dustin took us a huge slap in the face. She herself had a big history um, with Ned's brother. Um, she seems really uh, a, quite a bitter person who has this, from what she says, and we've got no reason to doubt what she's saying, she has this grudge against Ned Stark. He didn't bring her husband's bones back. Not only did he not bring her husband's bones back, but he clearly refused to say where they were. He clearly refused to let her have the body of her dead husband or, or say where she could find the body of her dead husband. And she took this as a huge slap in the face because he was coming back up north with the body of his sister, but he was refusing to say where the body of her husband is. And so she is there saying Ned, Stone, Ned Stark's bones are never going to be safe, lie safe in Winterfell crypts. So are we going to see her again? Yes. And I have a feeling um, that she will get her hands on Ned Stark's bones and destroy them. And I know that's not what we want to hear, but I just have this, I just got this bad feeling about it. What, if, if you'll permit me to go off to uh, a theory that I came out with a while ago about the Winterfell Crypts. I think the Winterfell Crypts, obviously, when you go down there, that you get the spirits of the dead Starks are down there, and you also get the statues. And I think the statues will be brought to life by the blowing of the whole of winter. If you're interested in why I think that there is a lot of... Uh, background working up to that point do go and check out the video it's called something like the crypts of winterfell and the horn of winter something along those lines um but i think that the statues will come alive if they have got the bones of the um 
uh, that stark there if they've got the sword apparently the sword across the the lap has to be there to keep the the spirit in there what what happens if ned stark's bones aren't brought there is his statue will be there but his spirit is not at rest there so when these other statues come to life his statue will not who whose other statues won't well um his liana for one and also brandon his brother why not well because we're told it's very minor point but the the lords of winterfell the kings of winter are the ones who have that sword um uh, some of them are taken if you are not a uh, and a brown and co probably took the one that was uh, was brandon's if you are not a lord of winterfell you do not get a sword so i think liana's liana's statue as far as we can tell ha didn't have a sword so her spirit was also not trapped in there so after all of this what's going to be left i think we're going to have a quite um it's going to be ripping at our heartstrings on whose statues are there because their spirits are not bound to Winterfell. Ned Stark, Lyanna, probably Brandon. I think that there's going to be just a few statues that are left. Um, I don't know. It's it's a theory I've just I'm, I've been working through over a very long period of time. But Barbary Dustin has been introduced by George R. R. Martin for a reason because Ned Stark's bones. Are going to be important they're going to be brought up she will get a chance to confront whoever it is who's got the bones uh, and i think that she will succeed in what she wants to do else why why was that character created um question from uh, Vet the Warlock again th saying a general question for you and everyone did it take people ages to realize septons are called septons because sept means seven or am I just dumb uh, I don't think you're dumb do not worry um, uh, yeah so th this is definitely sept is um, uh, septons uh, in the sept septors uh, yeah this is the the link uh, that we've got going across there uh, Michael Hansen saying the task has simply become too large, like Tolkien and the Silmarillion, contemplating the elves' deathlessness. Um, the Winds of Winter is the largest point of this entire story. That much is indisputable. The, the Winds of Winter is where the characters have gone to their furthest extremes. By the end of the Winds of Winter, Danny. Tyrion, um, Jorah, all of the group that are based around Marine, they are going to be either back in uh, Westeros or on their way back. Arya is going to be on her way back. Um, Bran is almost certainly going to be heading from the north back down towards Winterfell. Things are going to start squashing back in together. So uh, this is the point at which the story is at its widest. Uh, that is true. It makes it very complicated. I don't think it's impossible. I think he is working his way through it. But yeah, it makes a very complicated story to be writing. Um, uh, let's... I had a question from... Um, Roman Lakovet saying, what role do you think the Sand Snakes will have? I feel it isn't uh, talked about a lot. It isn't talked about a lot. Um, yeah, so I did have a question about the Sand Snakes as well. So there are eight Sand Snakes, and they will all have a role. This was Dalton Imperial uh, over on Patreon who's, who said, hola, Robert, uh, hola. Uh, how many of the prominent sand snakes will survive? They seem to be heading to or into high-profile areas that could soon be targeted by wildfire or dragonfire or whatever powers Euron can unleash, not to mention the normal threats of Westeros. So, sand snakes. Let's, let's do a quick wrap-up of the sand snakes. Um, Obara is the oldest. Obara has been sent to get Gerald Dane. Um, that is going to be dangerous. 
she I think that he is going to survive and will end up with um, Team Fagon. Now, whether she dies in the attempt or whether he manages to persuade her, actually, you know what, we're now joining forces with them. I don't know. Um, but that's part of what how we're going with Aria Hotel is going there. That's whose eyes we're going to be seeing this through. Now, Miria's the next one. She has been sent to take up Dawn's place on the small council. Um, and with her is going Tyeen, who is going in disguise as a scepter in order to make friends with the High Sparrow. Um, so they're both going to King's Landing. Sorella is almost certainly uh, Aleras, who is the team around Sam at the moment in Old Town. Uh, the youngest, uh, oh no, we've got one more. We've got Elia, who has gone with Ariane to go and check out what's going on with Fagon. Um, then the longest three, which are Belia, Doria, and Loreza. They're all staying in Dawn. They, they're going to various places in Dawn. But all of the Sand Snakes are heading off to places. I think we don't need to worry too much about the youngest three. They're, I think the oldest of them is about 12. The, the other two are even younger. But what's going to be happening with uh, Sorella? Um, well, she's in Old Town. I don't think Old Town's going to survive. I think there's a fair chance she may die, although she could escape in order to get back to Dawn to report on what's going on there. Uh, Tain uh, and Nymeria, well, uh, Nymeria is, uh, she, she's going there with a grudge. Uh, she hates the Lannisters, but um, almost certainly Cersei's going to be in control by the time she gets there, and she's going to hate having the Dornish on the small council, as um, uh, we we got Varys, who's in that final chapter. He kills Kevin. He says, Some will, someone will find a way to blame Dawn. Uh, someone will find a way to blame Dawn, and Cersei will try to get rid of her. Tyene, if she's getting with the High Sparrow, I think that Cersei will also try and get rid of the High Sparrow perhaps blowing up the Great Sept like happened on the TV show, something along those, those lines is definitely going to happen. So they are in danger. I have a feeling they may well die. Um, uh, and Elia, I think, has probably got the best chance. She's the one who's heading off with Ariane to go to um, check out what's happening with um, Fagon. Now, the the Dornish, the Martells, will almost certainly join forces with Fagon. And that means, I think, that Elia has to sort of play her part in this. So will they survive the Winds of Winter? I think some of them will, but yeah, definitely some of them are going into dangerous places. Um, Chaos Ballerina... Um, did Danny miscarry in the Dance with Dragons? Is this setting up something important? A third child with her third love? Um, yeah, so she she seems to be bleeding. Um, a lot of what happens in that last chapter is um, it's not quite a fever dream. It's all, all from Danny's perspective, but she does eat some berries that don't really agree with her. And so she starts seeing things. Uh, we can't take everything 100%. Personally, I think this is not probably not so much a miscarriage um, as just the return of her monthly cycle, which means that she can then start thinking about having children once more. So I think that's what was happening. I mean, it could have been a miscarriage, but um, I, she at no point before that really thought that she was pregnant she thought that she couldn't really have children so um yeah i don't know i i think the important point there is the fact that uh she now thinks that she might be able to have children or she she will start to think that 
Um, Andrew Kay saying, big Lady Dustin fan, uh, you think that she will put aside her grudge for the sake of the North? Um, yeah, I mean, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible she could put it aside, but I think George R. R. Martin has created such a strong backstory for her. It's not just the, oh, you didn't bring back my husband's bones, but the, also uh, she was madly in love with uh, Brandon Stark, and then uh, that got, she got passed over for that. That There's so much there with her previous interactions with um, House Stark that it's, I, there has to be an important reason for it. Um, let's go to question from Reflective Rambling. Picking one up, thank you uh, very much. Picking one up for Igrit Weirwood. How will the High Towers factor into the destruction of Old Town? Will they leave Doom style? Um, I I think that they they will fight against the obviously they will fight against the Euron coming in and trying to take out um Old Town. I have a feeling that House High Tower is not going to be completely destroyed. They will they will regroup somewhere and then take it back again. Uh, because Euron is not he's not gonna stay there. He's that's he's just about destruction. Um, and then he's going to move on. So I think that the high towers may well go underground. There is the high tower itself. Yes, I think this is going to be hugely symbolic. I, I still like the idea of a dragon landing on the top of it. I think visually that would be amazing. But let's not forget underneath there's it's a maze. It's like catacombs underneath there. I think that they could probably hide out in there on Battle Isle for a while. Um, Euron's not going to be hanging around and he's not got huge amounts uh the iron men are not they're not colonizers that that's not what they've ever done they've never gone on somewhere and then said right this is that mean back in history house hall and people like that did uh but this that's not the ironborn way they they want to raid and then they want to move on and euron will want to move on so they're not staying in uh old town long term um okay let's go to some questions from my patrons um let's see where i got up to diego godoy saying uh hola robert hola do you think bran will make it out of blood raven's cave and head down south by the end of the winds of winter if so how they had a hard enough time getting there with hodor um, if at that point Hodor and Jojen are gone, how will Bran and Mira manage to get back? Thanks. Um, okay, so yes, George R. R. Martin has basically confirmed that the Hodor moment will happen. Um, and he's also pretty much con um, confirmed how, in what sort of way. He said it's not going to be exactly the same. He's not literally holding a door. But it will be in the sense of you might say to somebody when you're defending somewhere, hold that door. And somebody, and so Hodor would be there preventing people coming through a doorway. That's the kind of feel. Um, so it's broadly the same, but it's just a slight tweak that George R. R. Martin wanted to say, no, it's not exactly the same. I'm going to do it slightly different and slightly better, but it's broadly the same. So Hodor is going to be holding back some people, some things, presumably whites or the others, holding them back while Bran and Mira escape. How can they escape? Uh, yes, they had a hard time getting in there, but Blood Raven's cave is not just a cave it goes hugely deep underground there's a river there the, the weirwood roots um are there all i think i was going to say almost certainly the, the clear favorite here is that they're going to escape through their underground tunnels probably the underground river which is going to take them south we've heard so much about the underground of westeros it has not yet 
been conceptually explored. It's not yet been important. But we're told about so many places having these this network of caves. Uh, we're told that there's networks of caves that go under the wall. We, we know that there's a network of caves that are um, under Blood Raven's cave. Uh, we're pretty sure that the weirwoods are connected to each other. We also pretty sure that old weirwood roots can be sort of like tunnels. That's what seems to have gone on, incidentally, in Winterfell's walls. There's these tunnels that go around inside the walls that are too small to be actual useful tunnels for adults to be going down. But children, someone like Bran, can scramble through them. They feel like tree roots. And we know that old weirwood, die, dead weirwood, seems like stone. So Winterfell, in those first chapters, if you read it, feels alive. That's the way George R. R. Martin describes it. He talks about the, the hot waters being pumped around Winterfell like, like blood through veins. This is the feel we should get from Winterfell, is not that this is just a castle, but feels like a, a living entity. So why is that important? Because we've got um, a huge underground system under Blood Raven's cave. We've got a huge underground system under the wall, and we've got a huge underground system under Winterfell. Uh, the most exciting way and probably the most likely way for them to escape is underground, perhaps even all of the way to Winterfell. Uh, I, I, we don't know, but that's that's the most likely way for them to escape. Um, uh, Leat Ruben uh, Lubenfeld saying, given Hodor's refusal to enter the crypts, I think that might be the door he's holding. Um, I like the thinking... George R. R. Martin has confirmed. For those who are unaware of this, there is a there is a moment when um, Hodor, early on in the books, Hodor refuses to go into the crypts. He seems scared of something in there, and George R. R. Martin has specifically confirmed that that wasn't a general thing. It's not that he's scared to go into the crypts. Full stop. That was a one off. It happened to be at that particular time that he was scared. Why? Because the spirits, Ned Stark's spirit was coming back. That's the the obvious implication of what he was saying. So um, I like the thinking. I think it's probably still most likely this is stopping people in Blood Raven's cave rather than or getting all the way back to Winterfell and then holding people off there. Um, okay, let's go to a question from... Cash. Hi, Robert. In terms of order in the narrative, do you expect the threat from the others will be dealt with first before the final rule of Westeros is determined, like in the show, or will their defeat be the final climax of the series? This I find fascinating because my thinking on this has slightly shifted. I think um, more the more I look back at the original idea, and George R. Martin has moved on a lot from the original idea, so we shouldn't take this as hard and fast, but his original idea was there were three three books he was going to do, three threats. The first threat was the Civil War, Stark Lannister Civil War. The second threat are the dragons. The third threat the others. And the first book was going to be about the Civil War. The second was going to be about the invasion from the dragons. The third was going to be about the invasion from the others and wrap up everything in that final um, story. So why is that important? Because when George R. R. Martin started writing this story, his thinking was clearly that the Danny's invasion, the dragon bit, her getting to King's Landing was going to be the first that happened before the others, the showdown with the others. But the, there's also his hints about how the ending might work. 
which is when he's asked a bit the famous quote about bittersweet it doesn't just end with i want the ending to this story to be bittersweet he then gives an example of what he means a very very clear example which is it's like lord of the rings this is what he says um he says it's like frodo he gives two examples from lord of the rings it's like frodo is broken by what happens in the story of the Lord of the Rings. So he himself cannot, he can't enjoy the world that he saved, which is why at the end of the Lord of the Rings, he has to sort of head off overseas. He goes off to the West because he has been so broken by what happens. That for George R. R. Martin, that is an example of bittersweet. Yes, the heroes win, but they are broken. The second example from the Lord of the Rings he gives is the scouring of the Shire which was not in the films. They kept it out of the films, but it's the penultimate chapter of the books. That, at a very high level, the hobbits come back to the Shire. They find that Saruman has got there before them and has ruined the Shire, turned it into a chopped down trees, industrial revolution, all the kinds of things the Tolkien hated. But the hobbits using the skills and abilities that they've gained during their adventures they save the day and get rid of Saruman at a very high level that's what it is George R. R. Martin again this is in the context of what does bittersweet mean what how do you want to do the ending to this he showers praise on the scouring of the shire he says amazing bit of writing he says I want that to be the feel that we have for the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. So, yes, we, we know that he loves uh, Tolkien. We know he loves The Lord of the Rings. But that we should read into this. What, what, is it, what is it about that feel? And the feel there is that the secondary baddie has to be defeated because... Every, the the big threat has gone, but the world is not yet fully right. We have to go back home. We have to make sure home is good and sorted. Now, the more I think about who is the Saruman figure in this, the Saruman figure, I think, is Euron. I, that's how he comes across to me. I think that's the the person that has to be defeated at the end after we've dealt with the big issues with the others, with the, the dragons, I think it's Euron who has to be defeated. So how does that figure it into it? That means that rather than Danny being the end point, we have to get rid of Danny. maybe that happens first before the others. Then we get the others being dealt with. Then we get um, Euron. That's my best guess at the moment. Um, it could happen in the order that it happens in on the show, but I don't think anyone was really that uh, bowled over by uh, the way that that final series worked its way through. So, um, yeah, I, I've slightly shifted my my thinking on that. My uh, and it could go either way. And this is one of those things. I always say I don't come out with. Um, predictions here. I just have working hypotheses. Um, and it, the distinction is that the, once I've read The Winds of Winter, I am very happy to change my mind on a lot of these things. And I will present that uh, not as my new prediction, but as what I now think is the most likely thing to happen. And this is one of the more tentative ones. How the ordering the iteration of events at the end of the story is one of the more tentative uh, working hypotheses that I have. But at the moment, I think on balance, it seems likely that we get the dragon threat, then the other's threat, and then Euron. Uh, but really interesting question. I'd love to know what people think of that. Um, Cloaked One, for this is a question for Isabel Torland. Thank you very much. Saying, hello, Robert. Do you think the pandemic and losing several friends in the last year or so will affect the overall tone of the winds of winter? Um, I mean, it will be dark. It, uh, it, and it was always going to be dark. Um, 
George R. Martin, for those who are unaware, it, this has been very painfully clear from his blog over the course of the last year, two years now even, is that he has lost a lot of close personal friends. Um, at a case, I think at one point he was talking about it's like one a month he was losing a really good friend. Um, and this has clearly affected him. Is this going to play into um, the uh, the story, the tone of the story? I don't, I think it was already going to be quite dark, so I don't think that will. The pandemic is interesting because I've I've often wondered, I'm not alone in this, I know a few others have, the possibility of there being some sort of uh, outbreak of something, probably in King's Landing, probably grayscale. Um, we've already we've got John Connington coming across, who's afflicted, we know, um, and keeping it kind of secret. Uh, and we we know other places where this has happened. It seems entirely possible that King's Landing is going to bear the brunt of a lot of bad things. That seems to have been something George R. Martin was building towards. Will he? Will his plans change as a result of the pandemic? I don't think so, personally. Um, it's not going to make it cheerier, I don't think. But at the same time, I don't think he's going to um, let it affect him too much. Um, question from... Tony Sled uh, saying, I respect you and your work, but I disagree with your dismissal of Stannis as a main focus of the story going forward. Why does his arc get dismissed? Um, well, thank, thank you for the kind words. First, um, uh, in terms of Stannis, I mean, I don't think I dismiss him uh, personally. Uh, I, I think that... I, I, a lot of this is instinct, which is why I was sort of slightly struggling for words. I don't see him as an endgame character. The reason why is because of his personality. His personality is that, as, as we know, he thinks that he's the king. He thinks it doesn't actually matter, and he's going to carry on doing his duty because he thinks his duty is to become king, and he's going to carry on doing that all the way through not making any compromises and if he survives to the end then he will either he will be king the only way to stop him being king i think is to kill him that i think is the the only logical way similarly he will not allow king of the north he, that's not what he's going to allow. That's not a thing that he's going to be. And they, the the Northerners are absolutely, they've, they've sworn fealty to King of the North. So there is a, a, a tension there already. He's also very slowly and surely losing his strength. Um, now, he came up with, I mean, it wasn't, the world's biggest army, but it was a significant army. They are dying. They're dying of cold a few days' march outside of Winterfell at the moment. He has got his biggest um, support is Melisandre. I think when John comes back, as I surely he will, comes back from the dead, I think that will be the point at which Melisandre moves from uh, supporting Stannis to supporting Jon. Because she's seen him so many times. We we get to see this, is that she says, I, I asked to see Azor a high reborn, and all I see is snow. She recognises that Jon is there, and at some point that is going to click. Because she's not stupid. She does misinterpret everything, but she's not stupid. Eventually it will click. Um, so why do I think Stannis, because if he survives, he will, he will be king and, or he's going to be killed. So I, the most likely thing is he dies. That's my, um, that's my take on it. So I don't think it's dismissing it. It's based on 
his character and where his story and his support um, has gone. Um, I think uh, one more. Uh, Antoine Dennison saying, uh, I love your deep analysis. Keep up the good work. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let's go to some questions from my patrons now. Um, Kia or Kaya, K-Y-R, what would happen if the others win in Westeros? Would they be able to take over other continents or could it be abandoned and whatever survivors escape to set up a new king or queendom? Well, the first long night, as we understand it, didn't just happen to Westeros. The first long night, we read it in the World of Ice and Fire, um, the, the winter extended out across Essos, parts of the Rhoyne, which is a massive river, was freezing would really down far south. And the legends that we have, and the further east you go into Essos, then the the less we can rely on this. But the legends we have of what happened over the far side of UT sound, they were very aware the Long Night happened there in their legends as well. They had heroes as well. And creatures came at them as, as well. So they had to save themselves somehow. So the best guess we have is that this doesn't just happen in Westeros. They would be able to attack down there as well. The question is whether an entirely cut off southern continent, if they're based on the equivalent of the North Pole, would they be able to get to Sothorios, the Summer Isles, places like that? Probably not, is the short answer on that one. So could humanity survive down there? Probably yes, but um, this is all theoretical. The the others are not going to win, in my view. Alejandro Martinez. Um, hey, Robert, hypothetical here. If Nymira invited Dan the dog, that's my dog, to join her wolf pack, do you think he would join? Uh, he's far too lazy, far too lazy for that. Um, I'm just joking. No real question here, just a shout out of appreciation. Um, so thank you. Sylvia Galasso saying ciao, Robert, ciao. Do you think we will learn who wrote the pink letter? Is it possible that it came from Stannis as a ruse to John? The language used in I want my bride back, I want my reek is awfully similar to the words Theon uses with Stannis in his uh, pre-release chapter from the Winds of Winter. I doubt Mance is the one who sent it after the whole thing with Theon's escape. I just do not think how he could get hold of a raven. Uh, thanks for the contents. Okay, so uh, will we learn who sent the pink letter? It's entirely possible we will never properly learn but it will get more clues and i think it will become apparent now the the question about mance couldn't have sent it because he can't see how he get hold of a raven uh personally there are ravens at winterfell um i see no reason why mance who's a a very able person would not be able to get hold of them. We're, it's quite uncertain what the situation there is with maesters because the the maester for the Boltons is a guy called Tybald who has been captured by Stannis. So he's not in Winterfell. So who's... And obviously Lewin died, who was the maester who was there beforehand. So... Uh, who is there now looking after the ravens? We don't know, but I don't see that as a, it's not an insurmountable problem. Um, it's it's entirely possible that he could get hold of one, and Winterfell Raven will have ravens that can go to uh, Castle Black, um, uh, as evidenced by the fact that the raven that took the um, the letter in the first place it went that way. So is it possible it was Mance? Yes, I think it's very possible. Um, the language echoing, I think, is an interesting point. My take why... Well, I did a whole video on the pink letter and who wrote it, so do check that out if you want my more detailed comments. But the we have to look at both the 
words that are used to do textual analysis of it and also the clear intent the clear intent is to rile john and get him to come down to um winterfell which is what it succeeds in doing it succeeds in doing it. John says, I am abandoning my post. I'm going to take people down to Winterfell. This is what leads to his death, because some of the loyalist members of the Night's Watch say, no, you can't You can't just give up on being a member of the Night's Watch. That's just pushing it too far. We're supposed to be independent of politics south of the wall. But this is John. He's headstrong. He gets riled up. So that's the intent of that letter. So if we're looking to see who is it who wrote it, we have to ask who is it who particularly wants John to be coming down to Winterfell to try and retake it uh, and attack Ramsay. Would, incidentally, would Ramsay particularly want that at this moment? Probably no, he doesn't really care. Um, they're, they're very happily uh, staying inside uh, Winterfell. There's no real reason to be taking on John. If John is not riled up, he stays at the wall. There's no point there at all. Um, the content, how it's written, the textual analysis, all hints at Mance. In as much as over half of it is talking about Mance, what happened to Mance, uh, the people that Mance cares about at, uh, up at the wall. Um, it's about Mance. Uh, this is not the kind of thing that Stannis would have really bothered to be talking about. Um, it's somebody who knows it is Mance Raider, um, who Mance himself obviously knows. Um, so Finally, in that, and I will come on to the word, the echoing from Theon. Um, finally, on that, we uh, have the fact that this is quite a manipulative letter. The whole idea of this is to prod John into action, push him into do, doing this um, from afar, make him want to come down and take Winterfell. Now, is that Stannis's style? Is that what Stannis is like? Is he the kind of person who thinks, okay, so I, I ordered him to do this. I said that I wanted him to do this. He's not done this. What shall I do now? Hmm. I think I will write a letter that when I'm pretending to be somebody else that I think will press his buttons, that will get him to... That's manipulative and that's not Stannis. That's not the way his brain works at all. It is the way that Melisandre's brain works. She is manipulative. She may well have done this. We know that she she's the person who saved Mance, gave him a mission, uh, and that was what he's gone off. Melisandre did not send him on a mission to going off on one there, sorry. Melisandre did not send him on a mission to go to Winterfell to save Theon. She doesn't care about that. That's not what she wants. She sent him, she saved Mance. She created this illusion for Mance. She gave Mance a reason to go down to Winterfell. Why? Because she wanted uh, Winterfell to fall for Stannis. And the way to do that is to get John to come down. So that is what was going on there, in my view. The world, the word echoing, yes. Reek Theon echoes what um, uh, he knows that um, Ramsay says. So does this mean that uh, Stannis then copied this down? and said, okay, this is the letter I'm now sending up with those words. Or has somebody else been talking to Reek? Has somebody else been hearing this? Has somebody else been taking those words just to try and make it sound like it comes from Ramsey? That, for me, is equally likely. So, as I say, slight digression, but I think that there's nothing about that letter that sounds like Stannis. Um, and there's everything about it that sounds like a combination of Melisandre 
and Nance, in, in my view. Uh, Mara Lee saying in past live streams, you mentioned that this will end up being a huge book. Do you foresee at least three volumes or do you see more now? Um, yes, it's going to be massive. Uh, George R. R. Martin has said it's going to be massive. Um, in his, not this last update, I think, but the one before that, he has said it's looking like it's going to end up poss being possibly being even bigger than the other ones that he's done. Uh, the biggest other being dance. Um, uh, and so I think that means, although he doesn't yet know, I mean, I think incidentally, the fact that he can now look and go, I think I know roughly how big this is going to be. That's a good sign. Just by the by, that's a good sign that he's getting quite close to the end. Uh, but also the fact that he's looking at it and going, so that's going to be at least that big. The, the, the biggest volumes so far have been released in two. So we are looking at at least two. Um, I think there's a there's a fair to middling chance that we could it could be even bigger and we could end up having three volumes. I think now more than three volumes. I mean, it's that's pushing it a bit uh, to release it as one book in more than three volumes three is pushing it to be honest but yeah i my estimate when i was trying to do a video called how big will the winds of winter be my best estimate was about 1600 pages 1600 pages you can turn into two stories two books um it's just too much to fit into one you could make it into three if you wished uh but uh, i think that probably two uh, Tony Sled, do you think it's possible after losing the Battle of Blackwater, Stannis changed, that it could be a new enemy he is planning for, uh, believing John and Sam? Um, so he did change. He his not not in the sense of his character, not in the sense of what he believed. Um, that he was king, but he came to the conclusion that uh, as king, uh, he wasn't just, the best way to do this is not just to sit on Dragonstone, build up another army and try and claim the Iron Throne. What he had to do was go to the north, face down the bigger threat to all of the Seven Kingdoms, having done that, to claim the throne, because that was the that was what the king of the seven kingdoms should be doing, should be protecting the seven kingdoms. So that was the shift in perspective. It wasn't a change in personality; it was a change in priorities. And so his his approach is: you go up there, we've got to kick out the Boltons, unify the North, face down the threat from the others, and then we can go down and take the rest of. Um, the Seven Kingdoms. So that's, he's just got a different approach to what he's trying to do, but his end result is exactly the same. Um, question from uh, Lady Pushkin saying, yes, I agree, Robert, when are you going to finish wins? We know it's you really, thank you. Um, doing a reread and so many more questions. Uh, Leo Tyrell, do you think he was a faceless man coaxing Pate to stay at the inn? then took his face. Do you buy the theory that Pate, now a faceless man, is at the Citadel to steal a book? I thought they were assassins. So this this is one one of the, the subplots that we are going to get in the Winds of Winter. So is that we get Pate. This is one of those uh, characters that we get um, that George R. Martin introduces and then kills in the same chapter. He is there down in Old Town, meets the alchemist. The alchemist looks like, and George R. Martin gives a very specific facial description, and he uses the same words, the same phrases, as the description of what Jack and Hagar changed his face into um, in front of Arya, way back in the story. So... Jack and Hagar changed his face. 
changed his face to look like the character that we then know as the alchemist, who then goes down to Old Town. He then kills Pate and takes Pate's face. Um, he takes key that he has managed to get from Pate and he takes, he becomes Pate. Why is this important? Because Pate then is the character who greets Sam. Pate is there. He's part of this gang now. And um, he, this is very, very, very heavily hinted. A faceless man has gone down to Old Town trying to extract a key to get access to the the deepest, darkest bits of the library. Why? Well, I thought they were assassins, says Lady Pushkins. Yes, they are. But they're not just assassins. That's that's the thing that we need to remember when it comes to the face of spin. I did a series on this ages ago. Um but I, I think it's something that's often misunderstood about the faceless men the, and their sayings. All men must die. This is not just a cool saying. This is not just a, hey, here's a catchphrase. This is an article of faith. They are a religion. They, this is a temple that they have, the House of Black and White. This is a temple. They believe in the many-faced God that being an expression of all of these other uh, god or all of these other gods that they've got there being an expression expressions of the many faced god is probably the better way to put it um but this is a religion and the central tenet of their faith is that everyone must die what are they faced with they're faced with and, and if you just for one moment think of think yourself into the situation of being a religious fanatic whose fundamental belief is that everyone must die. You're giving the gift of death to people. That's what they think they're doing. They're giving the gift of death to people because everybody has to die. What's happening around the world of A Song of Ice and Fire? People are not dying. People are being brought back as whites. We've got... Um, down in King's Landing, Kyburn is starting to do his experiments, creating these science whites. We've got uh, priests of law bringing people back as fire whites. We've got the ice whites north of the wall. This is in addition to the things that which are already going on around, like the House of the Undying, things like that. But this is not, to the faceless men, this is not just a, a thing which is happening in the world. This this is heresy. People, everyone must die. These are people who are cheating death. So what do they do? Yes, they take contracts to kill people, but they uh, realize that they perhaps have got a dragon egg as well. How do you kill all of these undead? Perhaps with a dragon. What do you do then? Do you kill the dragon? There's a lot of possibilities here about the exact thinking because we haven't quite got into all of the thinking about them. But they have got their own agenda. They're not just hired assassins. They have got their own religious agenda. And the key thing right now is people are not dying. And that is something that they need to address. And so, yes, they're trying to get information from um, the... Uh, the citadel not because they're being paid to but because they want to themselves um and carl kothnark saying must die and stay dead yes absolutely it's it's, it's cheating death to to die and then come back this is the the john snow route is is not working um Seema Broom saying, knowing that Arya won't finish the Faceless Men training, what must she accomplish narratively with the Faceless Men before she can leave Bravos? At which point will she be ready to play the game? I do have a question here, which this links into from Lady Maze Mormont, um, saying, how do you think that Arya will manage to get out of Bravos? She will have to contend with escaping her service to the House of Black and White, finding passage to Westeros, and ultimately finding her family. Um, I have to imagine she will not have many chapters, considering how many other stories need to make progress first. I don't think, first of all, 
that George R. R. Martin is going to limit the number of chapters for any character simply because he thinks there's lots of chapters that need writing. I think he's going to make he's he is at this point where he doesn't have to conform to anyone's desires or needs to do anything. He's got all the money he needs ever. He's got all the fame, he's got all the um recognition. He now is in a very, very rare place for an artist of complete independence. He can do what he wants to do, and that's what he's doing. And I think that he's not going to compromise uh, on the winds of winter, which is one of the reasons why it's taking a while. But in terms of what has to happen with Arya, now, I think, so the Arya will reclaim her Stark identity. This is, the, the, the narrative has been set up. She's needle is her that's her main link back to being a Stark. She's hidden that. She's not giving up on that. She's going to go back to that. Again and again, we see her killing people that she shouldn't be killing because they're triggering her with the her previous life sensibilities, like Darion the Night's Watchman, who has abandoned his post, or we get in the uh, Mercy pre-released chapter from the Winds of Winter, she finds someone on her list. So she kills that person. Not who she's been told to kill by the Faceless Men. They are not going to be happy about this at all. But she's killing someone on her list. So she's, she's not going to become this pure Faceless Man who is just has no identity at all she is remaining Arya Stark of Winterfell. And the question is, um, is she going to get chased out of town or is she going to be let go? I have a feeling she will be let go. Now, yes, maybe the, maybe they will put up a bit of a fight about it. But again, if we take this idea this is a religious a fanatical faith who believe that all men must die who is it who's on her kill list the mountain uh cersei these are where is she going to go she's going to go to winterfell at some point because that's where she will return and that's where the others are going to be heading towards actually what I suspect the Faceless Men will come to an understanding of is they have trained up this person to be an assassin and she wants to kill. They don't have to tell her to go off and kill the zombie mountain. They don't have to tell her to go off and kill the person who is bankrolling all of this science zombie business um, down in King's Landing. They don't have to tell her to go up to Winterfell to fight with the Starks against the others. She's naturally going to do that. So she has been trained up and they can let her go. So um, it may well feel to her like this is an escape, her reclaiming her identity and heading out. But I think that they will let her. That's my gut instinct. Um, and it might be one of those things where we have to read between the lines that it's not... Uh, because we will see all of this just from her perspective, but we will see that they are not, they, they could kill her and they don't because they're happy for her to go. That's that's my gut instinct about what's going to be happening there. How many chapters is that going to take? Well, we've got at least one. We've got the Mercy chapter. There will be at least one more in Brabus afterwards, because there will have to be the repercussions of what happened there. So minimum two, but I, I'm i expecting three or four chapters in Bravos before she gets across to the mainland, uh, because it feels like that just needs to develop a little bit more. Also, because underneath what's happening there, there is, we're starting to get hints of it, there's some politics happening in Bravos. There's going to be a change of sea lord. This is going to uh, impact on what Bravos does. I think George R. R. Martin will want us to see a little bit of what's going on there as well. 
Um, Kelly Johnson, who will kill the mutineers at Craster's Keep? Well, many are already dead um, and um, have been eaten, <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah, so this is this is cold hands. Um, Andrew Case saying, given her skin changing abilities, this is Aya and high birth would likely to be coveted by the faceless men. We have to think that some of that will play into the faceless men's agenda. Agree. Um, uh, Vet the Warlocks asking, do you think Mira will pick up Dark Sister? Yes, I do. Dark Sister, we have had confirmation from George R. R. Martin answering a question from History of Westeros a few years ago now, but this was a big scoop. Uh, that Blood Raven did take Dark Sister up to the wall, which is very clearly implying he then took it north of the wall when he went ranging. It is there in the cave. And um, I, I think that Mira will pick it up and take it down south to join the, the battle against the others later on. Or... The other possibility, um, which has come up in my mind, now we know from George R. R. Martin himself that Hodor is going to be holding the door, not as in physically holding the door, but going through a doorway. When I say people, this is almost certainly going to be the whites or the others. Hodor is going to be doing that. This is probably with Bran um, uh, in one way or another walking into him because that we've seen this on several occasions. This is what Bran does. Hodor hacks around with his sword and Bran goes into him. Bran was castle trained to fight. He actually has got some skill. Yes, he's still, still a child, but he did have some skills. Hodor didn't, so it makes sense for him to be walking into it. Anyway, if Hodor is there holding the doorway with a sword, fighting off others and whites, he is not going to have huge amounts of success unless he has dragon glass or a Valyrian steel sword. That is just the way that the story goes. So how on earth maybe he just gets lots of dragon glass and gets, starts fighting but perhaps that's what he does with Dark Sister. And perhaps he gets it. I like the idea of Mira getting it. I think that's most likely. But still, I don't think it's beyond the bounds of possibility that this is what Hodor is going to be using to hold the door. Um, question from... Uh, 444, what do you think caused George R. R. Martin to struggle uh, so much with the winds of winter delivery? I doubt this is writer's block or a lack of ideas, as he managed during the last decade to deliver the fire and blood. Um, and it's not too many projects either, as it looks that now when he reports good progress on writing, he's got more open projects than ever. So what is it that's holding him up? Um, well, it's this is all largely speculation. I, I think that a lot of reasons. First, and the most important one, this is going to be a big book. Let's not be around the bush. If it is, if I'm anywhere near right, that it's somewhere around 1,600 pages. George, if George R. R. Martin is anywhere near right, that it's going to be... Uh, as big as, if not bigger than the biggest book that he's written in the series. This is going to be a massive book. That does take time. Um, part of it is, um, and and I should I should say, he's not writing slowly, and and I think we often get into our minds that he is writing slowly. I don't think he is. If this has been ten years which is a long time. And don't get me wrong, he's definitely not writing this quickly. Uh, but if you if you imagine a random, I don't know, thriller writer who writes one book a year, 350 pages or so, I don't think many people would say that person's a slow writer. They would probably say, yeah, maybe he could write a bit faster, but I don't think one book a year, 350 pages or whatever, is a slow writer. 
what has George R. R. Martin done in this last 10 years? He's written Fire and Blood to start with, which is like 750 odd pages, plus The World of Ice and Fire, which was from memory 300, 400 pages, something along those lines. Plus, we've had a Duncan Egg, plus, he's written four episodes of Game of Thrones, each of which he says took him about a month. Plus, if we do get like 1600 pages worth or anywhere approaching that, then that's a huge chunk of work. This this is not him writing slowly. This is a lot that he has produced. Um, but obviously he's not writing quickly. What is preventing it? He definitely felt the pressure of the TV show. I don't think there's any way we can get around that. He's said that as much. He felt the pressure to, to finish it. That, I think, made him press forward too quickly. And then he just had to stop and roll back a bit. Um, this is, as we said... A very complicated book. There's a lot going on. Um, but ultimately, we also have to accept, certainly in the last couple of years, he has lowered it in terms of his priorities. And that has come at the worst time in, in as much as, yes, he wrote a lot. The first year of the pandemic, he wrote a lot. From the second year onwards, he wrote less. He was still making progress, but less. And the reason for that, he's been honest. He is prioritizing other things. He's also written, He's he submitted 200 pages already of Fire and Blood Part 2. He is writing stuff. Uh, he's playing an active role in the development of all of these TV shows. And I can't personally blame him. This is his legacy. He's been paid a huge amount of money for something which will be able to turn what is a book series into a whole universe. Um, I completely understand. But this is no longer his sole priority, finishing this book. It is a priority for him. He wants to finish it, but it's not, it's not top. Everything is a priority for him now. So there's, there's a lot going on there. Um, and as I've said, as far as I'm concerned, I... I will back him to finish it whenever he wants to finish it. I don't want him to rush it. I want him to do the job that he wants to do on this. Um, and if if his reprioritization means that we get a Duncan Egg first or Fire and Blood Part 2 first, I'll, I'll be happy with that as well. Yes, of course I want him to finish this. But if you give me another Duncan Egg, that's, that's going to keep me happy for a very long time. Uh, e. Marty saying, in Theon 1 from the Winds of Winter, Stannis sounds very confident that the Bolton bastard will not stop his strategy for the Battle of Ice. Will this be subverted? Um, ish. So what's what will happen at a very high level is that the Mandalese, the, the Battle of Ice such as we know it, is a force which has come out from Winterfell to take on the uh, the army, Stannis's army. The, the force that is coming out is made up of the Freys and the Mandalees. The Mandalees are going to turn on the Freys. The Stannis's army is going to join in. They will be decimated. That is going to happen, almost certainly. But this is going to leave them with a problem that they're still outside Winterfell. The Battle of Ice is not going to resolve things. They still have to get inside Winterfell. So there's, there's going to be Battle of Ice Part 2, which has to happen. And that will require a lot of joined up thinking and communication with the spies inside, as well as those parked just outside the walls and Stannis' army. And they will need to move quickly. And this is the point at which Melisandre and the burning of Shireen is going to be important. On the show, it, it they, they did show this, but it didn't. I don't think it had the clear impact. Is that Stannis's forces are literally dying of cold? They're killing their horses in order to just have something to eat. This is a situation which is only a few days away from getting completely out of control. Melisandre, if she can cast a weather spell that turns back winter, that is a huge spell to do, and gives them a chance to actually attack Winterfell. 
even getting to Winterfell right now is going to be a problem. And the roads between Winterfell and, and um, Castle Black are largely, not entirely, but largely impossible. Very hard to get through. If she wants Jon Snow to be heading down south, she's going to have to do something. So um, will it be subverted? No, but it's not going to go in a very straightforward fashion. Um, Chaos Ballerina said, Lady Stoneheart's, uh, this is picking up for Lady Stoneheart, so I think that's the name of the person. So Tywin hints the Westlings helped to set up the Red Wedding. Will she realise this? Will Lady Stoneheart realise this and want revenge? Will Lady Stoneheart meet any of her children? Will Jamie have to bring her members of his bring her members of his family like Cersei? So yes, the the Westling's mother, Westling, definitely played a role in that. Um, will she want revenge? Yes. Uh, Lady Stoneheart wants revenge on everyone. Will Lady Stoneheart meet any of her children? Oh, pardon me. Possibly. But where her motivations, Lady Stoneheart's motivations are about revenge because she feels she's lost everything in terms of her children. She thinks that Rickon and Bran are dead. She thinks that uh, Sansa and Arya are missing. Uh, she wants this rectified. Her and what is keeping her going, her spirit going, is is this lust for revenge. And when her arc, such as it is, ends, will be when she discovers that Bran and Rickon aren't dead after all, and when she finds that Sansa and Arya are safe. Bran and Rickon are going to be based up north. She's not going to come into contact with them. Sansa, I think, will also, from the Vale, head north. She will hear about Sansa, but that's it. Arya, she may meet. Arya probably is going to come, but when she comes back from Bravos, she may well come back to Salt Pans or somewhere like that into the Riverlands. She there may well be a chance for her to meet Lady Stoneheart, and this will be important for Lady Stoneheart for the reasons we said, but also for Arya because she has turned into this killing machine and she will see what has happened to her mother. And that has to have an effect on her. She has to look at Lady Stoneheart and go. Where, where's the love? Where's the mother's love there? That bit's all gone. All that is left is, is this hatred and need for revenge. Is that what I'm turning into? That that will be an important moment for Arya if that happens, which I think is possible. Um, Mel Misery Media saying, where will Danny start her invasion of Westeros? The logical place is Dragonstone, because this is um, where, uh, well, it's, it's the family home, it's where she was born, and also at the moment it's not very well defended. <laughs> so it's the logical place. This is where, and it also thematically, th she is sort of echoing Aegon the Conqueror, and he obviously came from Dragonstone in immediately of, with his invasion. So that seems like the right, thematically the right place for her to base herself. Tony Sled, wanting to be king is not a personality trait. We're talking about Stannis here. Stannis is stoic, deliberate and secretive. Couldn't Stannis be keeping Melisandre or everyone in the dark? We know he is not religious or talkative, thanks. Yeah, he could be. And, and no, you're wanting to be king is not a personality trait. Um, apologies if that's and that came across when I was talking about it. Stoic, deliberate, and secretive, but uh, wedded to what he believes is right and his duty. That's the bit. And it, because he believes that he is the rightful king, that then makes that a, a key part to what he is trying to do. Um, could he be keeping everyone in the dark? Uh, we know he's not religious or talkative, thanks. Well, he could, but on what? 
is the question. Uh, could he, he doesn't seem manipulative is the, the key point here. And I, so I don't think that he is deliberately holding back anything in order to make someone do something. So, because that doesn't seem to be his, he, he, he seems very straight and honest, um, brutal with his honesty sometimes. And, um secretive yes but at the same time we do hear him come out with almost absurd things that are on his mind yeah i will i will go to my deathbed thinking about renley's peach that kind of thing is like well okay fine um so this is uh he yes he's secretive not very talkative but he does say stuff that's on his mind um let's go to uh, Untroubled Water saying uh, In Deep Geek has the best and kindest chat going. Love the positivity. Uh, well, thank you, but that's obviously um, a compliment to the chat. Uh, and I, I'm delighted. I would agree 100%. The, uh, and this is why I thank and praise the moderators because what the moderators do is uh, so many levels help the questions help the uh, the chat going um uh get rid of spam if ever spam happens also the, the only thing i ever really say to them is this has to be a safe place for everyone uh, where people can just talk about the stuff that they enjoy so uh they do an amazing job uh, so thank you um and also while i'm doing my thanks patrons thank you um I say it every time. I cannot do what I do without your support. So thank you very much. If you would like to support this channel, there is a link if you're watching now in the chat, wherever it is. I'm sure one of the moderators will drop it in. If you're watching back later, there will be a link appearing down in the uh, description. Uh, it's patreon.com slash indeepgeek. Um, that's the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Um, let's go to a question from Sam Klontz the second saying, good day, Robert. Good day to you. Uh, in your opinion, when will George R. R. Martin let us know he's done when he's done typing, when the editors are done or when the book is about to come out? Um, interesting, uh, question. One thing he has said is that he will be the person who says it. This isn't going to be a, a release from the editors. This isn't going to be anything else. He is going to announce it when it happens, very probably on his blog. Um, now, I think, when when is he going to do it? Once he is sure that it is finished, uh, which sounds like quite a, a vague answer, but... I suspect he's not going to, when he has done his bit and then sent it off to his editor, I don't think he will count that as finished because the, the editor's job, and I don't think George Martin needs huge amounts of this, but the editor's job is to go through, and he trusts his editors, to go through and point out any problems, not just typos, but yeah, this doesn't make sense, I didn't understand that. And that may well push him to go and revise a few things. He quite late in the day in, in previous books, has uh, taken out a couple of chapters, written a chapter that he eventually decided to put in a later book, that kind of thing. So um, I think once he has reached the point where it's gone to his editors, they've given him comments, he's made any changes that he wants, and he's happy that that's the final version, that's when we, we're going to be told. That when this happens when this happens this is going to be the biggest publishing event of the year whichever year it is this is going to be huge so you are not going to be able to miss it and because it's going to be huge yes the publishers will probably want to uh get it for the best moment of the year for them whether that's tying in with a tv show getting it ready for christmas whatever that is but it means that there's going to be a lot of logistics around this. They will need to be buying advertising slots. They will need to be doing um, the print run. is obviously going to be huge distribution. Um, uh, there will be lots of rigmarole around this. So 
it's not going to be he'll announce it and the next day it suddenly appears. When he announces it, then we get maybe as much as three months of um, doing the, the business of actually creating the book. Um, Kay Johnson, will Danny's life force ignite light bringer? Um, I mean, I think this is the, I, I assume you're asking about the possibility that John will kill Danny and that will light the sword light bringer, which I, I thought of this as a possibility. I, even before we got to season eight, I did a video called Will John Kill Daenerys and theorized that that might, she has to light one more fire somehow. I don't know how that's going to be. She's most of the fires that Danny lights are with her dragons, but she she lit the funeral pyre herself for Carl Drogo. She's almost certainly going to be burning down the um, uh, something in Vase Dothrak, the home of the Dosh Kaleen, as she did on the TV show, something along those lines. And then there's a third fire. What is that? That she has to herself be burning. I don't know. So it's a possibility, is, is all I'm, I'm saying. Um, uh, DZ Bank saying, maybe George R. R. Martin should hire someone to finish The Winds of Winter now. No, he wants to finish it himself, and it's his story. I think he's going to keep it very close to his chest. There was an interesting point in one of his recent blog posts when... It's come the closest I've seen him come to tacitly say, hey, if I did get knocked over by a bus, it would probably be a nice thing for somebody to finish this off. One of his friends died. I said this earlier, a lot of his close friends have died recently, and he's clearly been very affected by it. And he said he's been writing, so I can't remember which book it was, that book that 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 guy had been writing for about the same amount of time that he'd been writing the winds of winter and then he says without missing a beat it would be really nice if one of his writer friends finishes that off for him now he's dead um and the implication he doesn't say it outright but the implication is the same would probably go for him in the winds of winter so um yes but not while he's alive and well it's him. It's, it's his his story. He's the writer. He can keep going with it. <coughs> Mel Misery Media. What do you think will happen at Hard Home? Well, um, yeah, I mean, a lot is happening up there. They're trying to get people out. Um, but it's it's going to be... So it's not the same... The TV show turn this into a dramatic moment john goes up there and we see the night king and we see the the others in action that that's we're not going to see that in the books that kind of thing might happen but it's not going to be john um to start with they've sent other people up they've got caught a pike uh it's gone but we will just get the there are dead things in the water comes the uh the word there I think the we're just going to hear about it, and it is that the the others have just wiped out the people who are there. So that's it. It's going to be tragic, but it's going to happen off page, almost certainly. I think. Um, I think I had one more question in the chat uh stupid monitor saying preston jacobs says he thinks he's halfway there 750 pages i think he's i think he's a lot further than 750 pages myself um he'd written 400 six seven years ago and um he said he wrote hundreds and hundreds um in 2020 as um and he had hundreds more to go um all the the language usage that he's got implies he's well over halfway now. Um, 
Tony said, saying, why are some people who enjoy George R. Martin's work so rude to him? I was late to A Song of Ice and Fire. The fact that people care about one man's work so fanatically is rare. Um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I, I sort of sit um, in the middle of what is a very positive community, which I'm very grateful for. Um, there are some people who are quite rude, but that's because they want the books. Um and so I understand the desire to want the books. Uh, I I subscribe to Neil Gaiman's take on this, which is that George R. R. Martin is not your bitch. Um, he's not my bitch. He's no one's bitch. He can write those books when he wants to write those books. It comes from a desire to have the books. Um, and I think that the the fact that the TV show ending was disappointing to many has uh, meant that the fans of the books now want what they in their heads have thought is now going to be the real ending. So they there is a desire for it. Um, broadly speaking, I would say that the A Song of Ice and Fire core community is very supportive of George R. R. Martin and is not rude to him in the slightest. Um, that's my take on the the sort of the core community. I think it's the people who are rude to him tend to people be people on the outside rather than the absolutely hardcore fans. They're people who really want the books, but they're not. They wouldn't count themselves as being part of the uh, uh, the core community. Um, Joel Elson, thank you so much for the uh, super sticker. Oh, you always do one. That I have to try and guess what this is. Is this a fox with fans dancing around uh quite possibly anyway i liked that one um <laughs> that's okay saying glad you mentioned the neil game which are always good to uh, um uh, quote some neil um let's go to a question uh from creative branches do you think the giant turtles of the ruin will play a part in the journey back to westeros or the miranese not um dragon versus turtle fights question mark is there a chance danny will go east to westeros if so what may instigate this journey so i think that the, the answer to the turtles i think sadly not there are for those who missed it there are some giant turtles massive turtles in the river Rhoyne that are worshipped by the people who live there, uh, by the Rhoynar. Um, the Danny heading east to go west, this is this comes from Quaith initially, and when she says you must go east to go west, and this was interpreted by people at the time almost certainly correctly that George R. R. Martin's idea was for Danny to go east to a shy. There she would learn about dragons, there she would learn about Azora High, and then she would head west after that. But George R. R. Martin is a gardener writer, not an architect writer, so although, <clears throat> pardon me, one second, <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, although <coughs> he originally planned it that way, he did change his mind. And uh, along with the getting rid of the five year gap, because this is where Danny would have spent her five year gap, there was originally a five year gap built in there for the dragons to grow, uh, for the children to grow up. He abandoned that five year gap, and that's the point at which he seems to have abandoned the idea of her going to a shy. So we're not now going to see a shy. He has confirmed, except possibly in memories and flashbacks. Um, so she is now heading west, but the quaith you must go east to head west is being um, reinterpreted as being more about you must learn the lessons from the east, the, the knowledge from a shy will be what allows you to head to the west so uh, that's where we're we're going with that um but the turtles i don't think i don't think there's going to be any more turtle turtle action going on uh the only possibility might be when danny does head west 
the fleet, if the fleet sets off from Marine, almost Varan uh, Varanasi has uh, not Varanasi. Uh, always have a mind blank about something very um, uh, obvious. Anyway, when uh, the they they head west, they will reach the bottom of the ruin, and then that's a point at which she will be um, uh, attacking uh, the the those of the old blood who have been attacking her, those who are supportive of slavery. Um, and that could possibly be a point where we see some... So she will pause probably at the bottom of the ruin, um, uh, and that is possibly where we might see some turtles, but they're not going to play a main uh, part of the story, I, I don't think. Um, Mario Angarita... Robert, always nice to see you. Thank you very much. I came in late, so I don't know if it's already been asked, but what do you think about the current state of Winterfell? Do you think Roos Daddy Lord Leech Bolton will prevail, or do you think he'll die? No, I think he'll die. Um, so I think uh, I've saw... I mean, I, I covered the first half of this, but I think ultimately the Boltons are not in as strong a position as they think they are. I think Melisandre will kill Shireen, cast the weather spell that will allow both uh, Stannis' forces, uh, who will be joined to the Mandalays, to attack Winterfell from the south, and also John and his forces coming from the north to also attack. And I think the Boltons will ultimately lose and the Starks will take over. And that, that will take us up to roughly the end of what happens in the Winds of Winter for the North. But no, the, the Boltons will will not survive. Uh, Sina Jensen saying, Hi Robert, sorry perhaps off topic, but I just don't understand how Robert Baratheon did not get suspicious about John. I mean, fair enough, if he really believed that Rhaegar kidnapped Lyanna, but if he also believed that he raped her, a baby wasn't an unreasonable outcome. And there the Honourable Ned suddenly was with a baby after finding his sister. What could Ned have said that made it more likely to be his bastard child by some random woman than Leanna's child? And by the way, never mind mispronouncing my name. It's nearly impossible to pronounce for anyone who's not Danish. Uh, well, thank you very much. I feel more confident on your surname than I do with your forename. Um, but thank you. Uh, that's very gracious of you. Um, I do like to pronounce people's names properly. I, I mispronounce so much, I know, but uh, I, do, I do try my best. Um, as for how Robert Baratheon could possibly have not thought um, that this was um, Rhaegar and Leanna's child, there's there's a few layers to this. The first is that that Robert did trust Ned. Ned was a trustworthy person. Ned's not the kind of person to lie. So if Ned suddenly turns up with a a child and says this is my child, then he would naturally believe it. Ned didn't just head off to the Tower of Joy. He went to Storm's End. Then he went to the Tower of Joy. Then he went to Starfall, and then he went back up to King's Landing. So there was there was a long period. Um, secondly, um, it's worth saying that Robert Baratheon had his mind on other stuff. He was being made king. He had to decide uh, who he married, if anyone, what he had to do with all of the people are on the wrong side during the war um he was not i mean that that was the kind of stuff he wasn't that into actually ruling the land but suddenly his plate was full and he had to deal with all of that kind of business who's going to be in the king's guard um what about the lannisters there's a lot of stuff he had to be dealing with um and thirdly although it's not 100 percent clear it's entirely possible that Ned did not come and present baby John. It seems, if you read between the lines, that uh, yes, John went up to Winterfell 
And yes, Ned stopped off at King's Landing en route. The the first part of that journey, Rob Ned um, and uh, John, baby John, was not there. Robert seems to have an entirely vague idea about this. I mean, he go, oh, okay, yeah, you had a bastard child. Okay, uh, this is much later, and he's even like quizzing Ned on, you know, who who is it? Who was this woman? What was going on? Uh, all those years later, he clearly did not have this. And why would Ned? Let's when you think about it, wandering up to Robert Breath and says, "Hey, look, it's my child. I've got a baby." That's not what he was doing, and I doubt that Ned would have been able to carry that off anyway. He, Ned's approach was to say nothing, uh, to act as if it was just very embarrassing, a stain on his honor, and that, in and of itself was probably the most sensible thing that Ned could have done right then. If he'd come out with a long and complicated, uh, this sort of explanation, say, so there was this woman, and then I slept with her there, and then uh, I went and picked up this baby from this. He didn't He didn't go through with lots of detail. He just went, okay, yeah, I've got, I've got a bastard child. My bad. Shouldn't have done that, but, you know, uh, he's here and then moved on and refused to talk about it. He refused to let anyone else talk about it either. And that felt to a lot of people like they thought Ned was. So it was probably quite a sensible move on his part. Um, Mel Misery Media saying, King Robert riding north, why didn't Ned use that as an opportunity to call his banner and deal with the king beyond the wall, beyond the wall given uh, Rob's love for war? Um, so uh, when um, this is, I assume you're meaning right at the beginning of the first book. So Robert Baratheon heads up north. And um, why didn't Ned say, hey, you should be dealing with um, the king beyond the wall? Well, first of all, at the time, they didn't think this was a huge threat. Uh, it, the Mance coming down bring an army down south to attack the wall that didn't that wasn't on the cards at that point in time there had often been kings beyond the wall they if, if the night's watch been worried about it they'd have said something the night's watch did not say something that wasn't what they are worried about secondly ned actually when i say he wanted to go to king's landing cat wanted him to go to king's landing uh, to find out what was going on because Somebody had killed John Aaron. Um, uh, what had happened with who'd been hiring the assassin to kill uh, Bran? Lots of these things felt um, like they needed investigating in King's Landing. So there, that was where the momentum was to go down to King's Landing. Robert commanded him to come down to King's Landing. Um, that was the discussion rather than what about the king because that wasn't really a threat at the time uh but it's an interesting question because if ned had thought outside the box then perhaps he could have done that but also perhaps robert could have gone eh, there's a big wall in the way that's what the night's watch are there for um Caris Ballerina for picking up thank you very much picking up for Isabel Torland do you think the very detailed way George R. R. Martin describes banquets etc could serve as a contrast between summer and autumn versus winter or the impact of food waste will have, uh, uh, will have uh, coming winter yeah so George R. R. Martin if you if you read the books as I'm sure you all have he does like describing the food in a banquet. Um, will, now we get to winter, will that become very obvious, the lack of description? It's entirely possible. It would be a really interesting and good way for him to show the sharp distinction. Um, he often uses it as a way to show a distinction between those who've got money and power and those who do not. And so it will often be the case. I could imagine it might be something, for example, in King's Landing, he might use it. 
Cersei eating huge feasts, whereas the people are starving in the streets. That, I think, is a juxtaposition that he might well wish to show. Um, then in the north, oh, also Littlefinger has got a, I'll talk a bit more about Littlefinger in a moment because I know I've got a question, but he's got a, a grain scam going on. He's been hoarding all of the grain um, and then people will be starving because they've not got any grain. Uh, question from... Uh, this is 444, saying, as I was introduced to your channel by a series of live streams about character arcs in the Winds of Winter, I wonder if you changed your mind on any particular character's arc since these live streams or on overall the Winds of Winter structure, size, number of required chapters to tell the story. Um, so I, not hugely is the sh short answer, but I have tried through this live stream, so I, I hope this isn't a cop-out, but... Through this live stream, I've tried to highlight a few things where I have been starting to think about changing my mind about stuff. One of the things I can remember specifically thinking I was going to change my mind, I did change my mind about was the Dothraki are not going to come down to Marine and across. I think they're going to head west and take out Pentos before going across the Narrow Sea. I've been doing a lot of thinking about... Um, Euron and the dragon and how that plays in to uh, the ideas towards the end when we get to a dream of spring uh, which I've mentioned and also the order the iteration of things in a dream of spring as far as the winds of winter are concerned uh, I tend to the view that the uh, although George R. Martin probably doesn't like this as an idea for the most of the first half of the book, we know roughly where it's going to go. Now, by by that, I don't mean he can't surprise us. Of course he will. There will be some characters who go off and do things we're not expecting. But we know roughly what's going to be happening in the Battle of Marine. We know roughly what's going to be happening in King's Landing next. Because he set these things up well, We and we know the characters involved. We know how Cersei's going to react to what happened with Kevin Lannister. That's just very clear, because we understand Cersei. So um, w the first half of this novel, we know a lot, I think, about how a lot of things are going to be happening. It's the bit in the second half that gets more complicated. Uh, Condide saying, um, Dear Robert, thank you so much for all your wonderful and dedicated work. It's amazing how relaxing it can be to listen to our long educated discussions about some fantasy world. Well, I'm glad. Um, I know that as a creator, you have to stick to a certain neutrality if you want to stay professional, but I would really like to know your feelings about the release date that keeps getting pushed back. I saw a stream of Jon Snow from you a few days ago. It was 2018, and you were so sure The Winds of Winter was coming out in 2019 for Christmas. How do you deal with these letdowns? Yeah, I mean, I don't know... Um, I don't know that I have to retain a certain neutrality. I think there's a lot of content creators who very clearly don't <laughs> maintain a sense of uh, a sort of a neutrality. I do try to as much as I can. Um, I don't... I don't count it as neutrality so much as I try to be objective. Um, but in terms of how do I feel, um, yes, I can remember back in about 2018, I was feeling confident um, about when The Winds of Winter was going to come out. Since then, I have moved to my current position, which is I'm no longer guessing. I'm no, no longer predicting when it's going to come out. All, all I will say is he is writing it, and each each day that we don't get it, that's a day that he's writing it and it's getting bigger, so it, there will be more for us to read later. Um, how do I deal with the disappointments? It gets frustrating, but um, we've got a lot of good stuff coming up this year, is one thing. I talked about this a little bit, actually, on the last live stream. In terms of TV shows, this is as golden an era as we are going to get in terms of particularly high fantasy TV shows. We've got House of the Dragon coming. We've got The Rings of Power coming. <coughs> Pardon me. We've got um, uh, more from The Wheel of Time. We've got uh, The Witcher 
we've got so much that is happening as well as we've got um uh, huge expansions in all of those uh, that is not just going to be restricted to one tv show but lots of things within those worlds you may not like all of those different franchises don't particularly like the word franchise but you know what i mean but undoubtedly there is a huge amount of quality out there even you can then add in things like the sandman is coming uh, which looks amazing so there is a lot to get excited about um and that's how I keep positive, because I focus on the things we do have rather than things we don't have. Um, and maybe there's a life lesson in there for us as well. I don't know. But um, it's, uh, yeah, be positive if you can, if you possibly can, be positive. Um, and so that's okay. Saying the Westworld trailer came out. Yes, indeed. The Westworld trailer looks very good as well. Um uh, uh, Antoine Dennison, yes, my name is Robert. Um, question from Jenny Bird. Hello, Robert. I am quite curious about the plot line in the veil. Do you have any strong thoughts on how all of that is going to go down? I don't think Harry the heir is long for this world, but will Sansa marry him for a time? What's going to happen at the tourney? How is Sansa going to make it to Winterfell? And what about Chekhov's mountain clans? Okay. The the key driver of everything that's happening in the Vale is clearly Littlefinger. So to understand what the plot is going to be in the Vale, we have to understand what Littlefinger is trying to achieve. He is wanting to establish control in the Vale. Now, where he was was that he had the Seven Lords Declarant who came to him and said, "We, I mean, they." basically nearly accused him of murder um, and uh, a complete coup. And he bought a year of time. He persuaded them with the help of Sansa to give him a year. And what has happened since then is you see he is one by one, he is buying them to his side. He is winning them to his side. Now, this is the main focus of what's happening. He's having a tourney. Everyone loves a tourney. A tourney makes people happy. He's creating a king's guard effectively out of this tourney, which will um, create something for people to aspire to, and you can you can reward people by getting them into the king's guard effectively. Um, Harry the heir, yes. So he is the heir to the Vale. And if he has Robin Aaron as the actual technical lord and he has, say, Sansa married to Harry the heir, then what that means is no matter what, he is in control because he thinks he controls Sansa. So that is what is going on there. He's got his grain plot going on. He has stockpiled grain. People were saying to him, well, you know, you could probably start selling it now. And he basically says, no, winter's coming. The moment winter comes, everybody's going to use their grain. My grain, the value of my grain is going to go up hugely, and therefore I'll be able to sell it and make a huge profit. But this isn't just about making money. He's got money already. He doesn't need the money. This is about control. If he can uh, pass grain to people to keep them alive, that will bring some people on his side. So the story of the veil in the winds of the first part of the winds of winter is Littlefinger gaining control, so he feels comfortable there. He has got the right people placed in the right positions. Everybody is supportive of him and his people. Alongside that, because we're all seeing it, through, we're seeing it all through Sansa's eyes. She will be learning the trade. She, we see it happening already but she is learning how to rule, how to be manipulative, how to be strong. This is a lot of her um, story arc. But Littlefinger, basically she did, Sansa asked him, I think it was the last last chapter of the last book, what, what's the plan? What's the plan, uh, Peter? And he says, we're going to get, I'm already the Lord of Harrenhal, so I've got a claim over the Riverlands. We're going to use you to be making establishing a clear claim over um, the Vale. 
which I've also got a hand in. And then you will have a claim over the North as well. He sees himself as, as presiding over this kind of kingdom of three parts, the, the North, the Riverlands and the Vale. That won't be the end of Littlefinger's game, but that's part of it. He will see chaos in the North. This is where this is heading. He will see chaos in the North. We know what Littlefinger thinks about chaos. He will see the Boltons have fallen, lots of claimants to the throne, to, to Winterfell. Who are people going to rally behind? He has got a candidate, Sansa. He is going to be bringing, he's not up there to, like on the show, coming and just sort of saving the day and sort of wandering around looking smug. His, the, the idea is to be pushing Sansa. So Sansa becomes Lady of Winterfell, and then he feels that he has got control of three different regions of the Seven Kingdoms. That is where this is going. Um, but I suspect that people will rally behind Jon, um, despite all of Littlefinger's machinations. Um... Question from Tony Sledge. Do you feel like time is running out for Baelish? Yes, it is. But I think that he's going to survive for probably certainly through this next book. And he will feel safe certainly through this next book. Uh, Kairos Ballerina is Rick on Feral. How will that affect Davos? Um, I think when well, we often use the word feral, um, I don't know if it's the right word. We have not yet seen Rickon. Rickon was um, pretty un untamed already to start with. He was a young child, and then suddenly all of his parental figures went away, um, and uh, he had a direwolf that he... To say he wasn't hugely in control of is probably the wrong way, but it wasn't as trained as others were. Um, and then he goes off to Skagos with um, just Osha, a, a wildling. Um, and that is a place that is notoriously ruleless. So what is he going to be like? Yeah, feral is probably a good word. I don't know how feral, but he's, he's going to... Um, He's going to feel like a wildling rather than a northern prince. And how is this going to affect Davos? I think Davos will just take it on the chin. He will understand this. It's how it will affect the lords when they see Rickon, because Rickon will be the first favourite to be the new lord of Winterfell when he gets produced. Here's Rickon. And if, he, if it becomes apparent that he's still a very young child and is doesn't have any kind of courtly graces that will start to affect some people's confidence in that and they will look for other stocks who might be able to uh, rule uh jewel elson saying for parker parish uh thank you very much for picking up a question what is the current state of house blackwood um uh, well there's they're still there and they're still alive but they have basically uh had to give themselves up to the lannisters so this is one of those um and th th those castles in the riverlands that jamie went through and got so um it will i'm pretty sure be one of those castles that we will see in the uh, the winds of winter changing hands back i think the lannisters will be kicked out but at the moment the riverlands are ostensibly at least including raven tree hall owned by the lannisters um that thing that's me caught up in the chat 444 Four. I know that you are not convinced that Stannis or Rickon can survive long. Do you see any role in Endgame for them? Um, if there's anything like the Night's Watch at the end, Stannis is a perfect Lord Commander. Something like causing a death of his only child can change his worldview. Um, yes, so I think Rickon is not long for the world. Um, 
I'm going to pick up on your other question here when you're talking about um, the prophetic direwolf names hypothesis. Uh, when you say you're not fully convinced, you believe that summer and ghost have special meanings, but not the rest. These names just told us who animals owners already are at the moment of receiving the pups. Sansa is a young lady. Aya is growing warrior like Nymeria uh, and so on. Um, I mean, I understand that, and I think some of them are, are stronger than others, and some of them, we have to remember these name namings happened very early on in George R. R. Martin's writing of A Song of Ice and Fire. And because he's a gardener writer, some of these may not have worked their way through um, as well as others. I agree, Ghost is very strong. Summer is very strong. Um, Grey Wind does work for me, but you know, it does require a little bit of explanation. Shaggy Dog, I, th I mean, I, if he does die, then it it is it does fit at the same level I think as as Summer and Ghost do. Um, Nymeria, yes, a warrior woman. Sansa, yes, a young lady. But the issue comes, and we have to see how this ends, because uh, Sansa being, if she ends as the Lady of Winterfell, as her title, that means suddenly Lady, as a name for a direwolf, takes on an extra meaning. Similarly, if Arya gets in a boat and sails west, echoing what Nymeria... Um, uh, I call her Nymeria Martell. She wasn't Nymeria Martell at the time, but what the original Princess Nymeria did, got into a boat and sailed west. Again, that takes on another meaning. So it's, I think we have to wait, is the short answer. But my best guess for Rickon is that no, he's not long for this world. I've talked about Stannis already, so I'm not going to go back in and talk about him. Would he make a good Lord Commander? Yeah. Yeah, he would, but I'm. I don't know what it is. If he does personally authorize Shireen's death, um, then I don't think that he's the kind of person to go. Actually, oh, I'm feeling really sad about that now. Perhaps I should go and join the Night's Watch. I think he will say that was the right thing to do because I am the king and I had to make a tough choice. I think that's where his mindset would be. Um. Uh, Mara Lee, you're asking about Euron. I think I've covered that. Um, and Londok20, you asked about Ned's bones, which I've talked about, but you also say, will we meet Howland Reed in The Winds of Winter or A Dream of Spring? Yes, we will. I think in A Dream of Spring rather than The Winds of Winter. George R. Martin has confirmed that we are going to meet Howland Reed. The, the thing is with Howland is he knows it all. He knows what happened back in all of that backstory. Um, so he doesn't want to reveal... George R. R. Martin does not want to bring out Howland Reed early because it has he has got the spoilers. So that's why he's being held back. And when is it that we want to learn these things? Probably in A Dream of Spring. There might be one or two things that would be useful to learn in... in um, uh, the Winds of Winter, but I think that broadly speaking, from a literary perspective, when is it that we we have the big reveals? And it, it, I think we often forget what a big reveal, in just pure literary terms, John's parentage is. Because we had the TV show and that was all explained and we saw it and we now banked that and we think, okay, that's a, that's not a mystery anymore. But this was one of the big mysteries that George R. R. Martin set up right at the very start of the book. He came back to it again and again and again. John's always thinking about who his mother might have been. Um, the, there's whole chapters of book one that are shaped around this idea of echoing what happened with John. Uh, this is a huge thing that has to be um, revealed at the right time, not just like a drop. This is going to be massive news, and we should learn it roughly at the same time that John does. 
um, not exactly, perhaps it may be, it's going to be like a, a few chapters earlier, but it, it can't be uh, just a random thing dropped in there. Oh, by the way, John, this, this is John parent, John's parents and then move on without, it will have an impact on the story. Uh, so that's okay. Saying if you want good house Blackwood content, let me recommend Joe Magician. Um, I would agree with that completely. Joe Magician, who has been on this channel several times, actually, I've not had him on for a while. I should get back in contact with him. Um, uh, but yeah, Matt is a big fan of House Blackwood, and I know that he does a lot of stuff on them. So please do go and check out uh, Joe Magician. Um, uh, he's one of the good ones. He's one of the good ones. Um, uh, Kenny Cross saying, I'm here, better late than never. Hello, Robert. Hi, Kenny. Um, let's go to question from um, Catherine Furseth. Um, Hi, Robert. Thank you for contributing to and creating a positive space for the fandom. You're very welcome. Thank you, especially now with all the speculations on The Winds of Winter never coming out. In my mind, your takes and assumptions on how the story will end is now established headcanon, and I find I can live happily with that. Well, I'm very pleased. Uh, I That makes me feel quite humbled and, and, and happy, but... I'm sure we'd all like the story to come out if we can. My question is simply, when, where, and why do you think Danny and John will meet? Well, this is one of those things that I think that the TV show roughly got, well, not in the exact way that they, they went through it, but it is um, it, the, the drivers for the meeting, I think they showed quite uh, easily. Uh, oh well, the the driver for John wanting to go to um, Dragonstone is very clear. They want Dragon Loss. The uh, the there will come a point when they yes they're aware of the, um, the others and the Whites, but the moment that they realise, which maybe when they get information back from Hardhome, we don't know, but the moment they realise the scale of the army that is coming towards them. The first thought is, where are we going to get weapons to fight them from? And that's when we will go, oh, Dragonstone. All, they're all of the, don't forget, all of those people there uh, for, with Team Stannis, they're from Dragonstone. So they know that that's where all the dragon glass is. So that is a very obvious driver for John to go there. And we've already talked about why it's likely that Danny will end up in Dragonstone thematically. Why would she be interested in John? Well, first of all, because John quite possibly is going to be hailed as King of the North, as Rob was. If so, she will see him as being a pretender to part of her throne. She believes that the seven kingdoms belong to her. And if he's there saying, nope, the North is separate and independent, she will want to at least meet him. But also, Tyrion is a diplomat, and he will think one of the most important things that Danny could do is to marry. And, Ma and Danny knows this is possible because what happened in Marine when she's marrying Hisdar was a story there, but also this is teeing us up to this idea that Danny could marry somebody for political gain. And that is definitely going to be in her mind and in Tyrion's mind as they go to Westeros. Who could she marry? Who genuinely, who could she marry out there that would advance her claim? And the assumption she doesn't want to be marrying Lannisters, and the assumption that uh, Fagon and Co are not in, um, then they're, they're not uh, going to be on her side. Who else is there? Who she could marry? John is the outstanding candidate, purely from political perspective. And then finally, the the key driver is Tyrion's relationship with Jon and with Bran. This is something, when you reread book one, it comes out very clearly, is 
Tyrion and John, George R. R. Martin, first of all, he shows us how similar they are. And then at the end, when they part, he has them literally shaking hands and calling each other friend. They have got a strong bond. They trust each other. They feel like they understand each other. Bran um, has that bond. Tyrion came back and made that saddle for Bran that Bran absolutely loved. There is a connection there as well. So George R. R. Martin didn't just create those connections for no reason. They will come in useful again. And so when John or indeed Bran wish to get in contact, he will he will know that this is somebody he can actually deal with. He he knows that this isn't just a oh this is a somebody who's out on a power grab. He he will understand who they are. Uh, Lady Pushkin is asking, do I see the Iron Throne as the ring in The Lord of the Rings? Um, to a degree, although George R. R. Martin also uses it um, uh, to show that this is a distraction from the bigger issues. So in The Lord of the Rings, the ring is, yes, this is all about power. Um, and this is the thing everybody's trying to get a hold of. There's clear echo across to the Iron Throne. But George R. R. Martin is wanting us to stop and go, actually, you know what? That is not the most important thing to deal with here. The others, the dragons, are more important than who is sitting on that throne. All of your civil wars around there look a little bit silly. That's where he's wanting us to sort of come out with that mindset, whereas we are always supposed to think that the ring, the one ring, is the most important item in all of Middle-earth. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Lady Pushkins. I've got, I think, three more questions now from my patrons. So now's a good time to drop any more questions into the chat. I'll try and pick up as many as I can. Lady Pushkin says, after Jamie's fever dream at the Weirwood Stump, um, quote, it made him that this is about the Weirwood Stump. It made him think of Winterfell and Ned Stark's heart tree. It was not him, he thought. It was never him. What did he mean by this thought or reflection? Okay, so context is that Jamie at high heart, he falls asleep on a weirwood stump. He has a dream, and this dream is hugely vivid, and it has a huge amount of meaning to it. I'm not going to break down all of that. I, I, I have broken down that dream before. I'm not going to break down all of it now. Um, suffice to say that um, there is a point when he and Brienne, and they, they, so they hear people coming towards them to, um, to challenge them, but not just to challenge them in terms of, like, let's fight, but to basically say, you broke your oath at him to say um <coughs> because that's one of the key themes about this are you an oath breaker or are you um an oath keeper and the people who come to challenge him on this people like Rhaegar people like the other members of the king's guard and they're saying you abandoned us you forsook your oath uh, as a member of the king's guard um, and Rhaegar saying, I entrusted the protection of my children to you. You broke your oath there. When he wakes up and he's he looks at the, the tree stump, he, it reminds him of a weirwood tree in Winterfell. And that reminds him of Ned Stark. And he says it's it was not him. The not him is one of the people who were coming and accusing him of oath breaking. Why is this important? Because one of Jamie's formative moments is in Robert's Rebellion, when he kills the king and he then sits down, he sits down on the Iron Throne and waits for to see who's going to walk through the door. Ned walks through the door and Ned jumps to the conclusion that he's sat on the throne. This is a Lannister takeover. Um, and he's really angry about this. And that kind of haunts Jamie for a while, because that is what then 
builds the myth of Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer, the Oathbreaker. But now he's reevaluating all of that because building on that sort of bath scene with Brienne, he's starting to reevaluate what has been going on. And he realizes actually Ned was not, he was not judging him uh, and coming forward and challenging him for breaking his oath, doing the wrong thing. He, he actually thought it was the right thing to kill the king. It was the sitting on the Iron Throne that Jamie wasn't actually there doing. Uh, he wasn't doing the thing that Ned thought he was doing. So when he's dealing with his own conscience, which is what is happening here with this weirwood vision, when he's re re dealing with his own conscience, actually, although he'd thought that the person who was accusing him that was that had been deep inside at the back of his brain all this time. He, he'd thought it was Ned Stark. It actually wasn't. It was actually the Kingsguard. That's who it was. It was not him, he thinks. It was never Ned Stark. That's who he thought. That's who he justified it was. And this is important because, again, this is the shift. This is Jamie. We talked about it slightly earlier in the stream. This is a long shift from Jamie turning his back on who he was and what it is to be a Lannister because he had gone through all his life blaming Ned in effect for that but actually he's now coming to a conclusion it's it's not really Ned it's not really Ned's fault the people really who are accusing him are his own family and the other members of the Kingsguard uh, Coach Ballerina saying, which major characters aren't making it to A Dream of Spring? Um, oh, I mean, this is a tough one. I think a few of the Sand Snakes that I talked about earlier won't be making it to A Dream of Spring. Um, I think uh, quite a few characters based down in King's Landing won't. Um, who else? I mean, I probably don't get much love for it, but I I think there's a fair chance Stannis won't. Definitely we, Shireen, definitely Hodor. Um, uh, who else is going to die? Blood Raven. And quite a few people down in Old Town. Um, so quite a few of the gang that we've met already. Um, I think Sam will survive, but I think a lot of those others won't. Um, AK Channel TV, hi there, uh, saying, did Magor die because of dark magic? Could Stannis die in a similar manner because of his involvement with dark magic? Uh, here's to all the rest of it. Uh, thank you. Um, did Magor die because of dark magic? Uh, this is Magor the Cruel. We're going way back in time here. Um, he died um, on the Iron Throne, basically. Um, was it dark magic? No, I don't think so. I think he was just murdered. And it could have been one of many different people. Could Stannis die in a similar manner because of his involvement with dark magic? It's possible. Um, but I think... I think that he's not going to die in the way he did in the, on the show with uh, Brienne killing him and him saying, do your duty. But I do think that there's a chance that he will die in battle or in some way that he feels that the other person has has a right to do what they do. Um, Andrew Kay asking how... Fagon could have taken Storm's end so quickly. I have a feeling they found Edric Storm and brought him on side for that purpose. Um, well, I won't go into all of the ins and outs of this. My personal take is if you look at who is in charge of Storm's end, um, you will find that the... And I can't remember whether it's Castellan. Um, mind blank on the exact name of the character, but... They um, they they are have a grudge 
against Stannis for not being personally left in charge. There is a, a so the person who is left as deputy is um, has a grudge, and I think they got into Storm's End via um, it being betrayed rather than this being um, an attack. An attack wouldn't have got it that quickly at all. Um, and I should have say a, uh, a shout out to uh, AK Channel TV. Check out the channel. Um, and think that's uh, Farring and Meadows. Yeah, I think those are the names. Thank you, uh, Sasa K. Um, question from Sam Shastain saying, Hi, Robert. You often speak about John being more wolfish when he returns to his human body after being in Ghost. Any ideas on specific wolfish things he might do? Like howl, bite, eat living animals or people, smell a lot, etc. Um, so, yeah, this is, I think, a fascinating question and something that we would just have to see what George R. Martin does with this. Um, John, almost certainly, I believe, will, when he gets killed, he walks into Ghost. Lots of foreshadowing for this. I think that's what's going to happen. So when he comes back, it's not him dying and being brought back. It's his body, again, lots of foreshadowing, is going to be put into the ice cells. When he comes back, it is going to be because his body has been thawed out and somebody maybe even him, has got his spirit, his soul, from Ghost back into his body. So that's what's going on. Now, I've got lots of theories about how that might happen, but what we've been told many times is that if you get caught in your... Uh, the creature you walk into for a long time, particularly as this second life idea, then their character starts to take over. So we would expect when he returns, John will be more wolfish. That's And that's as far as we can say for certain. The question which you ask, which is the right question, I'm sure of it, it was what does that mean? What does John mean what being more wolfish mean? George R. Martin has basically told us this is going to happen. But what does that actually mean? Uh, and I think... Some of it we can sort of say at quite a high level. We can say, yes, ghost, even if it's not wolfish, ghost is quiet. He will be a lot quieter. Um, uh, I think the pack thing is going to be a lot stronger, but also the being a loner is going to be a lot stronger. That kind of thing uh, as a more of a, a killer is, I think, going to be there. But what... Uh, one parallel I've come up with before that I think I'm convinced George R. Martin has at the very least thought about and probably is going to echo is um, the fate of Fitz, the character Fitz in the stories, um, the, the assassin stories by Robin Hobb, Assassin's Apprentice, Assassin's um, Quest and something else. Anyway, excellent books and they are important because if George R. Martin has a closest writing friend it appears to be Robin Hobb they, they share I think an editor um, he has written I mean the front copy of my version of Assassin's Apprentice it has this quote from George R. R. Martin that says um, Robin Hobb is uh, a diamond in a sea of zircons uh, which is wonderful sort of quote he, he rates her very highly and they started writing these books at the same time and the similarities are huge the absolutely I mean ridiculous in many ways but one thing which is there spoilers if you don't want to read it if you do want to read it and I haven't got it there yet so skip forward a minute or so in this video if you want to avoid um knowing something happens so Something very similar happens to Fitz, who has this thing called, it's called The Wit in Robin Hobb's books, but basically it's warging, it's skin changing. He has a wolf 
uh, a literal wolf that he could he skin changes into um and the same thing happens he his enemies catch up to him uh he basically gets killed not really killed but uh his body is buried his spirit goes into his wolf for a few days his friends dig him up and then get his spirit his soul back into his body there are more layers of complexity to that if you're a big fan of those books you'll know why cut many corners but that's the essence of what happened it's the same as what almost certainly is going to be happening with John. And the reason why that's fascinating is what happens next is that for a huge chunk of the next book, they are just trying to get Fitz, this character, to be less wolfish. How he eats, the way that he operates, the desire not to wear clothes, lots of these kind of things being feral. Is George R. R. Martin going to go down that route? I, this, I, will he be able to resist going down that route of John when he first emerges back into his body, not being suddenly this sort of sitting up as he did on the TV show and see, being almost immediately in control of himself and very clear on what he wants to do, but being very wolfish? Is he going to be able to resist that? I don't think he will. Uh, so this could be a big theme in the winds of winter it could be something which actually is a large part of john's plot um and let's see i think i've got uh, a couple more questions in the chat to pick up on um Uh, yes, reflective rambling, picking up for Vept the Warlock, saying, what do you think is the future for Widow's Whale? The sword made for Joffrey from Ned's. Uh, um, I mean, I've not done a study of this one, actually. It's quite interesting. Um, so in on the show, we shouldn't always just go from the show, but on the show we had this... Um, this way that widow's whale and oathkeeper go up together brienne and jamie to fight the war at, at winterfell and effectively they are fighting together with the two halves of ned stark's sword to protect ned stark's children i really like that idea i don't know whether that will happen i think they um if it was the showrunners coming up with that, I think it, it was a good. It was good. Um, I don't know whether that will happen in the books. Let me have a think about it, and I will. I will try and come back on that one next week, and I'll see whether I can work out um, whether there's any kind of echoing for that as well. Um, Carl Karsnock saying it means John will pee on every tree he passes. Phil H, he'll mark his territory with urine. Yeah, I see where you're going, chat. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. That's um, John's always had a problem with um, anger management, shall we say? I don't think this is going to help with it. Uh, Kartik Prabhu saying everyone dies and Jon Snow is revealed to be John Connor and the others are Terminators. Cheers. Uh, a good theory. I was thinking of doing another tinfoil theories uh, live stream, so maybe bring that on back for there. Um, Mara Lee, this is my last question from one of my patrons, Mara Lee, saying, what will you do, me, do once the book finally comes out? Will you get the talking book version and just listen to the story, or will you get both book and audio versions? Uh, will you be taking some time off to enjoy the story, and what would be your plans discussing it on your channel? Excellent questions. Um, I think the answer is I, I will get the audiobook and I will get the hard copy book and I'll probably get the electronic book for the Kindle as well. Um, George R. R. Martin is definitely going to be getting a lot of my money. Um, I think realistically, when it comes out, I will just, I mean, I might even book myself an Airbnb or something, hold myself up for uh, a couple of days and just read it nonstop because, I mean, this is going to be huge. 
obviously for me this is something i've been waiting for for a very 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 long time um i will book time off i will make sure that i can just read through it um and i will enjoy it. the first reading is just going to be me enjoying it because this is a story i've been looking forward to um for so long um but then yeah of course i'm going to make content for the channel um what i haven't 100 percent decided yet um because i you know don't want to think about it too much until I know it's actually happening. But I, I could imagine going through and sort of making videos, charting different people's um, plot lines. Um, my experience from Fire and Blood was when that came out, there were two or three questions which lots of people wanted to ask. So, for example, what was that king? Um, what was that king? What was what was in that letter that um, Aegon the Conqueror got? scent that made him uh, from dawn that made him grip the iron throne so tight uh, that made him fly to dragonstone and back and then end the war with dawn what was actually in that letter what was going on what happened with area um targaryen flying with Beleriand? that kind of thing there were some things that lots of people just had questions about i can imagine that there will be the same thing for a the winds of winter so i'll probably make some videos just trying to answer those questions but also do live streams because i think that that's what people want the thing i found hardest with fire and blood just i don't know <laughs> transparency was working out it's very easy when you've got a tv show and a tv program comes out and you can make videos about it you can have live streams and you can just assume after a few days if people are desperate to watch something then they will have watched it with a book particularly a book that big um i mean when when will people have read it i don't know um, some people will read it straight through others just haven't got time to read a book um at that speed so maybe it'll it'll take a few weeks, months even, before they get through it. So that was the thing I struggled with most. Um, yeah, I don't know how I'll get around with that. Um, it was just an observation. Let's um, uh, let's go to the chat. I'll try and pick up a, um, a few questions in the chat. Before it's, it's got quite late here, actually. It's been quite a good long live stream, some fantastic questions. Andrew K saying, the style of Fire and Blood, I couldn't fly through that one. Lots of gold in there, but a bit of a tough slog to read style-wise. I actually found it um, a quite fun read, I have to say. Um, uh, there was... the the For me... Uh, I'm not saying you didn't find it a fun read, but I think for what I found, because that was presented a lot more factually, it was a lot easier to sort of go through, whereas a lot of George R. R. Martin's work on The Song of Ice and Fire, he relies a huge amount on imagery and symbolism and things like that, that sometimes when you, maybe not on a first read-through, but on later read-throughs, you can concentrate a lot on the words and get even more from coming back and understanding what symbolism or imagery he's using in particular scenes. Um, Kelly Johnson saying, did Rhaenyra really go down on Mushroom? I will leave that to your imagination. Jay Martinez, uh, how would you end Winds of Winter? Last chapter POV. I did uh, answer this one right at the beginning, but I think there are two big and obvious things, either the dragons arriving in Westeros or the others arriving in Westeros. Um, Reflective rambling, asking, will we get Blackfish and or Benjen back in the winds of winter or spring? Any hope of getting my crack team uh, up of the two? Uh, the Blackfish will reappear in the winds of winter. I have absolutely no doubt about that. Um, Benjen, I think we will see him. Uh, at the very least, we'll understand his fate, I think. Um, whether that's in the winds of winter, I do not know. Um, Deanna saying live streams to discuss uh, three chapters each week would be a good pace thank you, good idea um, uh, do, 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 do we will get in the winter winter what we'll get more of nuncle or bastard bastard by a long stretch I imagine he does like the word nuncle um, but it will have a and a use in House of the Dragon, though, at the very least, Nuncle, I would say. Um, this is when 
Aemond and Daemon Targaryen face each other just before their fight above the god's eye. Um, and Aemon says, you have lived too long, uncle. Um, so, <laughs> so it will almost certainly, as we got so few lines of, uh, of actual dialogue that can be used in the TV show, almost certainly they will have to use that line. Um, Andrew Kay saying, do you expect Bran's likely contribution against the others will heighten his claim and make it more sensical to be a king compared to the show? Quite possibly. Um, or it could just be um, whether, it, whether it's his contribution, maybe. But if there is some sort of great council, the person who wins the great council is whoever has got the most support and at the end of all of this there won't be many people left the the targaryens will be gone um nobody will want the lannisters or whoever's left them being in charge um who is it who's got the power left the house stark will be the most powerful house sansa doesn't want want it she'll want to stay up north john i don't want it john won't want it uh he's going to be gone rickon i think will be gone i won't want it the only person left is bran so that by a process of elimination as much as anything else um uh peppy gates is saying i'd like to know your thoughts on Tyrion, as so many people think his path is getting darker but he did drown which is usually a turning point in character direction yes um he <sighs> He is a character with shades of grey. George R. Martin has said this before. I don't think he's getting darker as a character. I think he has had dark moments already, but I think that he will end up as a degree of conscience for Danny. I think he will see that this is his chance, his last chance, uh, that he had a chance at being Hand of the King. That didn't really work out so well. Um, and finally, he's got this opportunity to go back. And I think he will see it as some kind of... Um, I mean, I don't really know the word, but I, a, a chance for him to actually finally... Do, be the life that he or live the life that he ought to live. So I think that there will be a degree of optimism there. Uh, Kelly Johnson saying, will John get Euron's Valyrian armor? I think that Euron will die falling into the God's Eye Lake fighting John. And I think that the armor will be lost in there. Um, Okay, I think with that, I'm going to start drawing this one to a close. It has been epic length, uh, some fantastic questions. I, I wonder whether we may, maybe we'll do some more of these book ones, another couple of weeks worth of book ones, because uh, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, so maybe next week we could look at Fire and Blood Part 2. What's going to happen there? That might be quite fun to do. Uh, so let's do that. Um, there will be another Lord of the Rings one along in a couple of weeks as well. So look out for that. If you are watching this back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here will be a link to some more live streams. If you'd like to watch some more live streams, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon. If you wish to support this channel, that's the best way to support this channel. Uh, but that's all for this time. I will be back same time next week. Take care, everyone. I will see you again soon.